Um, this open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth. In order to mitigate transmission of COVID-19, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public may follow along with the deliberations of the meeting ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law this meeting will feature public comment for this meeting the arlington school committee is convening by zoom as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join please note that this meeting is being recorded and some attendees are participating by video conference accordingly please be aware that others may be able to see you take care not to screen share your computer and anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording all of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available in the Novus Agenda dashboard. We recommend members of the public follow the agenda as posted unless I note. Otherwise, um, shortly we'll be turning to the first agenda, uh, item on the agenda. I will introduce each speaker. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you after you have spoken. Um, Oh yeah, we're not gonna have public comment after each thing. Um, each vote taken in the meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. So let's go ahead and do attendance and make sure that everybody can hear us. I just need to change. All right, um, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. I don't see him yet. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey. Present. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Mr. Hainer. Present. Um, and um, so, and Dr. Bodie will not be here tonight. Um, Dr. McNeil. Here. Mr. Spiegel. Here. Uh, Ms. Fernandez. Here. Mr. Mason. Here. Uh, Mr. McCarthy. Here. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez. Here. And uh, Ms. Bird will be joining us uh, later for uh, her agenda item. So the first item on the agenda tonight is public comment. Um, there are three people signed up for public comment this evening and I will call on you, um, Ms. Holler, Mr. Corcoran and Ms. Hall in that order. Uh, this is a reminder that you have three minutes for public comment and um, the committee does not respond. Um, and, but some items that you discuss or bring up may come up later on in the meeting. So uh, the first person for public comment is Ms. Emily Holler. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, Arlington School Committee members, and thank you for giving me the time to speak tonight. My name is Emily Holler, and I am the parent of a first grader at Thompson who is in the hybrid program and who is also happily participating in pool testing. He's very proud of himself. I am here tonight to ask the school committee to engage with your stakeholders and create an executable plan for providing the option for full in-person learning this school year. Though our incre incredibly hard working teachers have been pushed down on the vaccination list, which is a source of mass frustration for all of us, we know their vaccines are coming soon. And I'm thrilled to see that the Massachusetts teachers unions are pushing their own plan with the last mile vaccine delivery proposal. And I truly hope that they are successful. What we are asking of you is that you take the initiative and begin the, pl uh, the planning process now so that we do not lose what very little time we have left once the teachers are vaccinated. I believe this planning process should have been well in the works by now, and the fact that there has been no public discussion doesn't bode well for our children. Arlington parents are watching as other school districts are moving ahead while we sit back and we wait, and it's the kids that are suffering the most. The parents of Arlington want to know what we can do to help and support you as you move this process forward. A Facebook page titled oops, a Facebook page titled Back to School Arlington MA has been set up and is helping inform and engage the Arlington parent community about important school committee meetings, information and information and decisions. This page has 130 followers after only being live for a week, all of whom are trying to figure out what their lives are going to look like for the next several months. 
We need to see progress and we need to see effort. What can we do to help you get our children back in school full time this semester? We are here and we are asking you very directly. Thank you so much for your time and please feel free to reach out to me anytime to discuss this further. You all have my email address. I do know that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brian Corcoran. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Thank you and good evening. My name is Brian Corcoran. My son is a hybrid first grader at Hardy and my daughter will join him there in September for kindergarten. I'm here tonight to encourage the school committee to take a more active leadership role in the effort to get our elementary students back in school full time as soon as possible. At the last full committee meeting, in her response to the superintendent's comments about achieving the 35 hour requirement with more specials, the chair's graciousness and restraint was admirable, yet her honesty revealed an unfortunate reality. The district is offering an insufficient product which parents are to some extent free to take or leave. And we're all generally accepting this arrangement, I suppose because people are working tirelessly and we're doing the best we can. I know the former is true and I certainly hope the latter is not. This is not an attack on the district. My son is receiving an, inc an incredible first grade experience this year, given the impossible constraints, but it's actually grossly insufficient. There is simply no way the high quality can make up for such a dramatic decrease in quantity. And the return to the proper quantity will only be achieved by getting back in the classroom full time. To do that, the impossible constraints must change. We are already aware, aware of the measurable ones, six feet, number of kids per classroom, staff headcount, et cetera. But I believe the constraint that poses the biggest threat to getting back in school full time, even by September, is the paralysis that our community is experiencing because of fear and ambivalence. To engage and resolve all of the other constraints effectively, we must overcome this paralysis. And we can do that by returning now to the things that we can do safely and responsibly. Clearly, I believe that having all students and teachers in the elementary schools full time is one of those things. Of course, for those drawing different conclusions, families and teachers alike, I hope the district continues offering a full remote option. Another thing that I believe can be done safely and responsibly is for this committee to resume in-person meetings immediately, and I encourage you to do so. It would be an act of leadership benefiting many planks of an effort to return. It would signal a seriousness of intent to parents and demonstrate a solidarity with faculty and staff. Simply put, it would model for the community a path out of this mess that we are in. If any committee members would not feel safe attending in-person meetings, outstanding. You can have the option for remote participation participation, modeling that our solutions need not and should not be uniform. Tonight's agenda item, school reopening plans, and my understanding that this is a recurring agenda item is encouraging, but it's a small first step that needs to be followed by many more. And I hope you'll consider the one that I have proposed. Currently, most of our kids are in school twice a week, on a screen once a week, and on their own the rest of the week. This cannot possibly be the best that we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corcoran. Um, Ms. Julie Hall. We can't hear you if you're talking. Hello? Now we oh. can. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're um, good. All right, good, um, good evening. My name is Julie Hall. And um, I've had, I have four children and my oldest is in college and my youngest is a second grader um, at the Brackett School who is in hybrid. And I also have a seventh grader at the Audison. Um, and the first thing I just wanna say is thank you for um, taking the time to let me speak. And I want to um, really just say how grateful I am for the experience that my seventh grader is getting in the sand cluster at the Audison. The communication from Mr. Marringer has been unbelievable and over the top. Um, I'm very grateful for that. Um, also, bracket communication has been great. Our teachers have been outstanding. Um, but as your first two callers have eloquently spoken, um, I, I agree 100% with them. I feel like I'm in a vacuum. So I just wanted to be a part of tonight to see where everyone else was at. 
And I'm happy to hear that those first two speakers have the same opinions that share that I have. So I'm just speaking to you from my heart. I think that we need to get our kids back to school safely, all kids. My kids I know are gonna be okay, um, but I think there's a lot that won't be. And that's my fear. It's not just my kids. I have the resources to get them an education somewhere else if I need to, but that doesn't mean everybody does. And um, I, I just think, there's two, the, we cannot live in fear any longer. And I'm very encouraged by the pool testing, but even more than the pool testing, how about what's happened with the teacher testing? We had an email from the superintendent that I think 3,200 tests have been performed since September. And it was it 28 cases were positive, which is like 0 0.04, which is incredible. So I hope that we're relying on science. I hope that we're not living by fear. And I hope that the word equity is used every day, all the time. And I'd like to see equity in action. And that means getting our children back to school. Thank you, safely. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Hall. All right. Um, so the first item on the agenda tonight is the Arlington High School update on the FY22, otherwise known as the 2021-2022 school year program of studies. Um, Mr. McCarthy. Good evening, everyone. Um, looks like I'm off mute so everyone can hear me. Um, I'm occasionally gonna be looking up because I've got two monitors going, so just so people know. Um, so uh, at this point, everyone should have received a copy of the program of studies for next year, uh, along with an update sheet that is linked to it. Um, is there anybody that did not receive a copy? I can potentially send it to you now if you'd like. Okay. Um, Mr. McCarthy, Ms. Fitzgerald posted it in Novus, so we have it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, there is a slight addendum to that, and I will cover that in a moment. Uh, but we have some policy and general information updates that I did want to convey. Um, in the sheet that you were handed, uh, they are listed at the beginning, and then it goes down to the bottom where policies are, and I've highlighted in yellow the sections that have been updated. The first is the class of 2022, which is next year's senior graduating class. Uh, their PE requirement has been adjusted, and that is because last year, uh, because we did close uh, because we, the way we closed down um, the in-person education in the spring, um, students were not able to access their PE courses to complete the graduation requirement. Uh, they were able to access it and participate, but it was not in a way that we felt would connect with the graduation requirement. So we have lowered that uh, from, uh, from five PE courses down to four PE courses, which translates to one ninth grade PE class, which every student takes, and three quartered electives, as opposed to the four that students would typically take over the course of their uh, time at Arlington High School. The other policy adjustment actually comes to us from DESE, and that is in regards to the Science and Technology MCAS. Uh, there, the um, classes of 2022 and 2023, which would be next year's seniors and next year's juniors, or this current sophomore and juniors, um, have found they've given them a different version of what competency determination will be uh, that will translate into if they pass a course that fulfills the state's requirements, which for most students is their physical science course, which is offered freshman year, or their biology course offered sophomore year. I will say in talking to Sam Hoyo, a director of science, most students have completed that requirement and any of those who have not have already been flagged uh, and are being prepared for um, support in that manner so that we can get those competency determinations finished. Uh, as far as courses we are offering, uh, we're not offering many new courses for next year. Uh, part of that is because we offered several new courses last year that with the changes to the programming for this year, we weren't able to offer. So we want to try and put those back into the mix. Uh, we would like to try and offer those next year. Uh, Two courses that are new will be adulting and technology, which is actually we're offering this year and is going very well. Um, it covers 
general life skills for students. We've actually had quite a few parents and students reach out to us saying they're very excited about this course. Uh, it teaches students how credit cards work, how to balance a checkbook, um, general life skills, how to plan out a budget. Uh, also, we will have, in addition to our early childhood education course, which is child and parenting, very excited about that as well. Uh, the addendum is for a course that was not added, and I apologize for that oversight, um, and that is the Power of Protest, which will be held by our history department. Uh, it is a semester-long course that will um, do case studies and talk about the history and social impact of protest uh, from the Montgomery bus boycotts, the Seneca Falls Convention, all the way up to the Dakota Pipeline protest and Black Lives Matter. So we're very interested to see how that will progress. Um, it kind of came out of conversations in the history department, but also a lot of student interest. So we're happy to talk with students and see what they're interested in and explore those topics. Um, the remaining courses, we do have some that are on rotation, which will be reactivating. So astronomy and oceanography will be reactivating this year. Very excited about that. Um, and while that activates, weather and climate and our physiology of exercise courses will go dormant for the year and they will come back the year after. Public speaking will be making a return to Arlington High School. We're very excited about that as well. I keep saying we're very excited and it's kind of funny because we are, you know, we love offering these courses because the students are, you know, very gung-ho about that and every year they always ask us what they want. Uh, the courses that will be removed uh, will be the history of Massachusetts, history of the Middle East, Introduction to Italian. Now our goal there is, um, right now we have a four year Italian program. We wanna try and create a more condensed program, a college prepar uh, preparatory course, which will be intense Italian one, two. Um, and we're hoping that'll come up in the years in the future. Um, and that students will be able to take it once they complete their Spanish or French um, or Chinese requirement, Mandarin. Uh, the other courses that will be removed are philosophy of science and philosophy, introduction to philosophy. Uh, that comes because the teacher who was running it no longer works at Arlington. Um, they left. And so we don't have anyone that would be teaching those courses. Uh, at this time, I have sent you the course descriptions. Uh, we do have uh, two other adjustments that I do want to let you know about, and then I'll open it up to questions. One, uh, they will be name adjustments. So our physical science course, which every freshman takes, and our modern world history course, which every freshman takes, uh, will be, uh, the department has spoken about it, they've spoken to the students, and they have decided they want to offer those as heterogeneous courses. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with that title, uh, we do offer some courses heterogeneous, which means they're not honors or advanced. Every student takes the course. Once in the course, the student can review the syllabus, talk to the teacher, and decide if they want to do additional work uh, to reach the honors credit. Uh, that work could vary anything from presentations, reports, um, discussions, independent research. Um, so we've done that with a lot of senior level courses. Our English curriculum at the senior level is heterogeneous. And so the social studies and science departments really wanted to, they did it this year and it has worked incredibly well and they want to continue doing that uh, to offer everything at the heterogeneous level for freshmen. So at this time, I've, I believe I've covered anything, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Um, I actually have just before we start, I have a question for the rest of the committee because hopefully somebody can answer this for me. Um, just so the public knows, we don't get to have these conversations other than uh, on Zoom with all of our friends. So um, we we approve the program of studies, right? But as far as I know, we never approved doing that said program of studies in either a semester or a full year model, right? Do, does anybody like are, are if are do we approve the the like sort of the semester or the full year model, or we just approve the program of studies and that's it? Does anybody know? It Mr. Schlickman? Well, uh, there are two, two entirely different questions. The program of studies basically details what we're offering. I understand. Uh, right. And the obviously, the semesterized scheduling is probably more of a budgetary thing. So while we'd have some say on it, uh, I don't think that it necessarily touches into the program of studies. Okay. 
unless, <laughs> in, unless the program of studies is specifically stating that we will be doing a semester uh, semesterized approach and we don't want that in there. Mr. McCarthy, is your program of studies stating that we are doing a semesterized approach? No, it does not. Mr. Thielman? Yeah, I would just add that I believe we, we did have a role in approving the semesterized schedule when we approved Dr. Jenger's, when we approved the school opening reopening plan in the fall, because I think it, I think it included a schedule. Got it. Okay. So what Mr. Thielman is saying is, is correct. Um, the program of studies is typically a, you know, a description of the offerings and some of our broader policies. And so we did present the semester I schedule, geez, I think it was probably August or September uh, when you all approved it. So, you know, we are in conversations right now, weighing out what has happened in the past, and we will discuss that further and, and hopefully we'll bring that information to you eventually. Great. All right. So questions for Mr. McCarthy on the program of studies. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Well, I was just going to add at the beginning, my memory serves me and I'll stand corrected. In the past, when the program of studies was presented to us prior to COVID, there were some courses that were just listed for one semester. So uh, I assume that if we've passed a course of studies in the past, we've, we should have recognized full, full year and uh, uh, single semester courses. They've been offered in the past. Am I correct, Mr. McCarthy? Yes. So to, to clarify, we do offer full year courses and semesterized courses. Now with the change in schedule for this year where we did semesterize the school, um, what we did was we took the full year courses and they were offered over the course of the semester and the semesterized courses were offered over the, the quarter. And so that balanced out in terms of the amount of credits being offered. But yes, in the program of studies, there are semester long courses, which we could define rather than semester, we could define as half year and full year courses. There's also quarter long courses. I just want to say that I'm I personally, uh, as an elementary, former elementary teacher, I'm very happy that you're uh, trying for the uh, heterogeneous grouping and still affording uh, students if want to do extra work. I think that affords the class an experience of uh, everyone sharing similar experiences. So thank you for bringing that forward. I hope it's successful. Absolutely. I, if actually, if I could speak to that very quickly, because I know we had a lot of questions about that uh, when we were discussing with parents. Um, I know there's concerns about making a heterogeneous system uh, around the physical science and the social studies. Uh, we have had it in place for, I have to go back in time because it started when I was teaching English. So probably 10 years ago uh, at the senior level of English, it has worked incredibly well there. Um, it brings a lot of diverse uh, conversations and it just adds a, a new flavor and depth to the course, which we really enjoy. Uh, and students do have the opportunity if they want to elect to do the additional work. Um, and like I said, it's, it's different per department what that work is, but they do have the option to display additional work to get the honors credit. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Other questions for Mr. McCarthy, Mr. Cardin, and then Mr. Thielman. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. So uh, it looks like there were eight classes which were switched to heterogeneous for the pandemic year, and you're keeping two of them as heterogeneous. Does that sound right? Um, <laughs> I don't know the exact number, but that, that's what was listed in the, there was, there was an FAQ about moving to heterogeneous, there were eight classes listed um, and we're preserving two of them. Yes, yes, it doesn't include the ones that were already heterogeneous before this year. Right, right. Um, so I, I, I have some reluctance to, to move to heterogeneous classes on a permanent basis um, just by a change in the program of studies. Um, I would prefer, I know you, I guess you, you said you talked to the students. I, I would prefer to see some, you know, some feedback from the students. I'd prefer there be a discussion with the parents. These, these are freshman classes. So it would be the eighth grade parents that we would, that I would like you to, to discuss it with. I don't know if, if any of my colleagues feel the same way, but um, I, I'm reluctant to approve shifting them to heterogeneous tonight. Thanks. Uh -huh. 
All right, Mr. Thielman, I, I, as an eighth grade parent, I uh, agree with Mr. Cardin that it should be, there should be some engagement. I understand that there were a lot of, um, that, you know, we made a lot of changes this year, sort of um, in flight to make schedules work, et cetera. Um, but this seems like more of a substantive and uh, this seems like a change that would roll forward. And so I would like to see more engagement with um, families and the community around it because it, it does seem like a, a significant change. Mr. Thielman. So uh, a couple of questions. One, um, I, I believe the committee, the school committee and our curriculum committee should have a conversation with Mr. McCarthy, Dr. Janger about the semesterized schedule. I think that's something that should take place. Um, it's a new experience for our students. It was implemented because of the pandemic. Um, and we, we have, I think many of us have heard from parents, some pro, some con. And I think we need, we need some data and some um, understanding if that is a plan for next year. Have you, Mr. McCarthy, have there been kind of, have there been any conversations about next year's schedule and whether it would be, you would keep the current semesterized schedule or go back to the old program? Uh, at current, the department, we had a conversation in the department head meeting and they are surveying staff at this moment, but um, we are still collecting data around that. Okay. So I think just to, just to kind of set the stage, I think we need to see that data, of course, but then I think, I think parents and students should be surveyed about mm -hmm. this. And then I think we should all talk about it here um, because there are varied experiences in the community and a lot, of, a lot of anecdote and some data through a survey would be, would be helpful. And even though we don't, we don't approve the schedule, we approved the program of studies. Last year, we did approve a new schedule. And so there is a reason, there is an, there is, we should be having this discussion. So the school committee needs to be part of the, the discussion. I just wanna make sure we're clear on that. Everybody, is that? So let me make that point. The second point I want to make is, uh, the second thing I want to ask about is, could you just um, <clears throat> uh, give some background in terms of the staff's thinking? I know you said that, but just to recap, uh, on the heterogeneous uh, courses for that, that you have here, astronomy, oceanography, public speaking, what was the, what was the, what were the drivers of the decision, of the recommendation? You mean in terms of going to the heterogeneous for physical science and for modern world yes that's correct i'm sorry yes i just i just want to make sure i understood yep, so yep. um in those cases this year uh we did end up doing it heterogeneous uh in order to uh, alleviate stresses on the schedule and on room placement and you know they had i was not part of the department's meetings on these matters uh the department heads brought it to me after, and we had a conversation, me and the department heads in regards. They said that uh, in the emails and comments I had from teachers, it was that they felt the students were able to have a broader conversation about items, that they felt um, it raised the bar in terms of the curriculum and the discussions in the room. And those were the, the, the two biggest pieces that were pretty consistent across the people I talked to. Okay, thank you. That's that's all I have. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call on Dr. Allison Ampey yet, but just as a follow up, Mr. McCarthy, I assume that all of the feedback on the heterogeneous classes has not been uniformly and unanimously positive at every turn. So uh, unless maybe it has, maybe you've only heard good things. Um, but I would be curious if you've had um, what the um, what some of the downsides have been that have been shared with you. Okay, so to speak on that, um, the departments which felt they did not want to continue this process for various reasons was the math department and the um, English department. They felt that it was easier uh, in sections like that to break the groups apart. Um, and I shouldn't say break the groups apart, but separate them into advanced and honors uh, to address the needs of those specific groups. I don't have specific quotes from them at this time though. But there was no negative feedback at all from anybody in science or modern world. In the teachers that I spoke to, I, you know, the departments came to me and said they had a conversation as a group and decided as a whole. Uh, out of the teachers I spoke to, I did not get negative feedback. 
the the I did have one lukewarm teacher who said, I'm not a huge fan, but I can see where it's a benefit and I would go with it. But I am happy to go back and speak to the teachers and the department heads and collect more data if this group would prefer that. The direction that I heard uh, from at least myself and Mr. Cardin was certainly to connect with them, but also to connect with the community, with parents, and uh, with students, because that would be really helpful. Um, Dr. Ellison Ampey. Thank you. Um, Mr. McCarthy, first a question about the handbook. I'm a little confused uh, on what page, page four. It says that students whose year of graduation is 2022, 2023, um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and have, has demonstrated competency in one of the four tested disciplines, biology, chemistry, uh, intro physics, and technology engineering in either the 1920 school year or a prior school year. Um, it's, it's that last bit that either the 1920 school year or a prior school year. Um, I'm thinking about the freshmen. So the only course they would have taken at this point is uh, the intro physics last year. So yeah. just to it, clarify, you're talking about the sophomores of this year. Yes, yes, yes. I'm talking about the sophomores this year that uh -huh. they would have taken intro physics last year. Mm -hmm. And that's the only course that qualifies. I mean, that that if, counts towards this requirement. Yes, and that does count towards the requirement if they passed it. I believe the wording there is because the original document sent out by the state um, said that last year's seniors were also included in that. And so they could have taken a course their freshman or sophomore year or their junior year as well. The, um, this was sent to me uh, through the Department Chair of Science. And so I believe that they used the wording that the state put out. So yes, so, it would be a freshman would take physical science uh, last year, and if they passed it, that does fulfill the, the competency determination requirement. Right, but if they didn't pass it, it doesn't matter if they passed biology this year because it's not included. It was only last year or prior. You are correct. And so we've identified those students that did not pass last year in order to give them supports and to prepare them for when the state does offer it. The state actually just released the dates for the MCAS exam for this year. Um, I would have to check the specific dates, but they are offering the science exam in June. So we would have, we've identified those students and we are preparing them for that exam. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me though as to how many students that is. I don't think it's very many. Okay, so the bottom line is it is, it's not a typo. I, I just can't see why if they pass biology this year, why that wouldn't also count, but whatever. Um, I, think, I think it's because the, the because they are offering the science exam right now. And what they've done okay. prior was if it didn't run, if the, like last year when it didn't run, they mm -hmm. basically said the student's opportunity to pass that exam did not exist. So if they pass the course. So my assumption would be right now, they are on course to do the exam in June. If that exam does not run in June, then I assume that they would fall back on this statement from years prior, where if a student passed the bio course, for example, that would fulfill the requirement. Right, but there's no years prior for this year's sophomore, except last year, right? Yes. A anyway, I'm, it, it doesn't, it, I feel like it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but if it's what the state is saying, then I guess we have to go with it. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is I'm also very interested in understanding, uh, having a discussion about continuing the block schedule and ask as you gather the data that there is, that the information is broken down by type of student as in our students with high needs or our high achieving students and because part of it, what I'm hearing anecdotally is that the kids who struggle more in school are really doing well with the box schedule. 
because they have fewer things, you know, there's fewer transitions, there's fewer things to be, balls to be juggling in the air. Um, and I'd like to get that fleshed out into actual data and understand how does that, is that significantly different for say our honor students or, or whoever, um, or average students, because I think this is something that we should be taking into account as we, well, by we, I mean you really, uh, as a decision is made, because if this is a way of enhancing achievement for our high need students, it doesn't cost anything. And maybe we should be looking at this, mm -hmm. um, even if it's not perfect for everybody. And I understand there's problems mm -hmm. for people who are taking the AP tests or, or who are taking advanced math, but can we work around, you know, try and fix those problems for those people if it's helping our students who need more help. Um, anyway, so that's, I just ask that that be considered too. Thank you. Um, oh, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, yes. Uh, just while we were talking, apparently um, Ms. Perry, the department head for English is on this because she texted me and said the, uh, I know there was a conversation I had said the English department was going to split between honors and advanced. And I want to clarify, she texted me and said the English department is wholeheartedly in support of going heterogeneous for freshmen as well. So I misspoke earlier. I do apologize for that. Ms. Exton. Um, I just want to piggyback on my colleagues who were talking about the heterogeneous courses and um, sort of thinking that that needs to involve more of a conversation. And um, I appreciate you sharing about the department heads because that was going to be one of the pieces is how do teachers feel about it, these courses and how is that working for them? Another thing I'm thinking when you're um, gathering more information from parents and students is um, making sure that you're getting that information from a diverse group of parents and students because um, I think a lot of the reasons for the um, heterogeneous groupings is so that students who might not have had opportunities to be in an honors course or may have at some point been excluded from those or in them. Um, and so I, I just worry that, um, that not all, all voices will be sort of contributing to the, the thoughts about whether it's working or not working. And why we should either continue or not continue to have them. So just being mindful of how everyone is being included in those conversations. Thank you. And Mr. McCarthy, can you confirm that it is the policy of the Arlington School Committee that students can elect to take courses um, at whatever level they so choose regardless of teacher recommendation yes. coming into ninth grade? Yes, we do not have any um, prerequisites when it comes to a level of a course. We do sometimes have prerequisites when it comes to the order of courses. But students can elect to take honors or not, um, even despite what their teacher might recommend. Yes, a student can take AP or honors or advanced. Uh, they have that choice, Great. regardless of what a teacher recommends. We right. often advise people to talk to their teacher and have those conversations so that they are making an informed decision though. Any other questions from the committee for Mr. McCarthy? Dr. Allison Ampey and then Mr. Cardin. I just wanted, I forgot to mention this before, I just wanted to point out that part of the reason we began the heterogeneous classes in the first place was that it was a requirement of, or at least a suggestion by the NIAS um, I think maybe a couple of review cycles ago that this was something that they felt was important to um, have at the high school. Thank you. Um, if, I, if I may. Go ahead, Mr. McCarthy. Um, you're absolutely right. That is when it was implemented across the board uh, when we diversified it. I actually ended up with, was teaching a course, the heterogeneous course 
uh, I believe three or four years before NIAS came. So we actually were, were a little ahead of the curve, which I was very happy about. Um, but yes, when, when NIAS came around, it was something that we had discussed about doing on a broader platform. Mr. Cardin. Thanks, I just wanted to clarify. So the proposal before us doesn't actually change freshman English to heterogeneous. Are you saying that that's another step you're, you're taking or, or not? Well, uh, it sounds like from this committee right now, that would be something that you would want me to gather more information on before we take a vote on it. Uh, that would be something we would be discussing though when I come back with the more information, when I come back with more information. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure where the majority is, but, but that, that's fine, thanks. All right, any other questions for Mr. McCarthy? Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to say that I admire the high school staff for doing the work to create heterogeneous grouped courses that, that are rigorous and provide support for kids. Uh, and one of the advantages of doing the semesterized block four, uh, four by four block schedule is that it also provides for acceleration uh, for students. So that if particular, you know, I'm, I'm speaking as a former high school math teacher in that you can move between courses quicker so that you can complete your geometry course in a half a year, then move on to the next course, then move on to the next course. And the net effect is to get students who may not have been performing well in middle school, who all of a sudden gain love of mathematics uh, to make it to uh, calculus and higher level mathematics without having been penalized by their placement coming out of eighth grade. So th there's a lot of reasons why the four by four semesterized block has advantages. There are some disadvantages as well, but uh, uh, we, we've experimented with it this year and I want everyone who's thinking about the impact both positive and negative on the four by four block this year to understand that the data we're collecting is also data we're collecting in a pandemic year where other things may confound the data. But I'm, I'm very pleased with uh, what I'm seeing from the high school in terms of adapting to the current cir uh, uh, circumstances as well as becoming more uh, open and accessible for all students. Thank you. Any more questions for Mr. McCarthy, Mr. Thielman? I just, just two things. One is <clears throat> we haven't yet received data on the semester, the four by four semesterized schedule here at the school committee that I've seen. So we need to, at some point, we need to get that data, digest it, and talk about it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so that's what we need for that conversation to be thoughtful and helpful. And um, re regarding the heterogeneous classes, I think. Um, that would be a very good discussion to have in a sub in the curriculum subcommittee um, with some faculty there to guide us through their thinking. That would be the best way to handle that, or department heads there. Right. So um, I know that you know one of the intentions of bringing this tonight was looking for our approval. If there is a motion to do that, um, fine. Or um, if somebody would like a, to make a motion to, um, or, or we can just sort of provide feedback to Mr. McCarthy that we would like for him to come back to us with um, more of the information as we've discussed tonight. So I defer to the committee on what you'd like to see happen with that. Is there a deadline, oh, Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Schickman. Is there a deadline? Is, is there a pragmatic deadline for the high school uh, for uh, getting the course of studies out to the real world? Uh, if there is the possibility of delaying two weeks, I would support uh, uh, viewing this as a first read. Mr. McCarthy. Uh, uh, so like anything, we would like to try and get it out there um, as soon as possible, because we do, we, we are looking at next year 
and what scheduling will look like for next year and getting recommendations and requests from students. Um, you know, I had uh, put on the schedule that we would be looking at March to open up the window to start having requests coming in as to see what courses we'd need to run and what staffing requirements we would need. Um, I can post on the website uh, this, I can post this as a draft on the website uh, with notating, noting which ones are still in question, or I could hold on posting this. The last year's program of studies is in place uh, until I can bring this back in two weeks. I'll defer to the committee on that one. Mr. Thielman? I suggest we do this. We, it's not gonna be posted till March. The curriculum committee is scheduled to meet when? When is the curriculum committee meeting? The 24th. So the, we have a meeting on the 25th. We can meet on the 24th and talk about this. And on the 25th, we can vote. <clears throat> and that's plenty of time for March. Will that be enough time though, Mr. McCarthy, to collect any feedback? I mean, we're heading into a, a break week. Um, I'm pulling up the calendar right now just to take a look at that. Um, obviously we will be on vacation for the next week. Um, I'm sure the department heads would be able to gather the information from the staff. I'm not worried about that. Um, I should be able to gather information and feedback from parents and students. Um, you know, that gives uh, three school days to gather that information, assuming I'm bringing it to that meeting and I'm not reporting it in advance to Ms. Fitzgerald. So that would be a procedural question. I don't know if you would need it in advance, how far in advance you would need it, or if I could bring it to that meeting. I know well, it doesn't sound like there's too much time to do it in advance. So I, I don't see how, I, I think we would have to get it uh, live. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I mean, it's, it's I mean, Thursday night at 7.15, right? So. I mean, I would speak to the department heads about coming to that meeting as well. So we would try, we would try and collect as much data as we can. Mr. Hainer. And then just, Mr. Just, just for clarification, are we seeking, trying to get Mr. McCarthy to bring the information to the full committee or add a, a little more squeeze to him to the curriculum committee the day before? I just want to clarify that. Well, I, think we, I mean, I think we could do it either way, right? I think that's what we're trying to figure out. Okay. It sounds very tight. The timing sounds very tight to me to collect actual meaningful feedback from the community and um, families. And I actually think that this is a pretty significant change. We're, we're adding disciplines uh, as we sit here. So <laughs> we're up to three now, um, which is a pretty significant, which is a pretty significant change. So I, um, I think that it's important that we, um, you know, that we collect some feedback on it before we're in a position that we need to make a decision on it. Uh, I, Mr. I would, I would, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. No. I would agree that that getting the information is important. I'm just suggesting if he's going to give it to the full committee, there's no need to have a, a, to go to the curriculum committee ahead of time because the best that they're going to do is make a recommendation to the full committee the following night. Uh, if time is tight, I'd, I'd suggest we give him as much time as we can. Mr. Schickman and then Mr. Cardin. Uh, I think that the curriculum committee uh, can discuss things in a little more informal aspects so that we can gain a, a firmer footing on what's going on before we walk into the meeting. So, <clears throat> so that if it's agreeable with Mr. McCarthy, uh, I, I would love to have him invited to talk about it at the curriculum meeting. Uh, to that point, I move that we accept the program of studies as a first read and authorize the, uh, the district to publish this with the notation that the uh, program of studies is subject to final approval by the school committee. Is there a second for Mr. Schlickman's motion? I'll second it. Okay. Uh, discussion. Mr. Cardin? Thanks. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> I, I do think this is worth having more conversation at a subcommittee level. And, <clears throat> and I agree with the motion because I think, Mr. McCarthy, you can publish. The only thing we're, we're talking about is actually the change that was made this year. We, we suddenly switched classes from uh, uh, 
um, leveled to, to heterogeneous. So I, I think people can start, you can put the notation that we're considering making these classes heterogeneous, but in the meantime, um, you know, students can start thinking about whether they, they might want to select honors or not. Um, uh, and in the end, they may not get that choice. I mean, they'll get the choice um, by selecting honors by doing extra work, but they may not get the choice to be in a separate class of only honors. So, um, you know, I, I think it's an important issue and we should work through it. If, if the Wednesday after break is too early, then we can schedule a meeting, um, you know, the following week. And, and in the meantime, you know, the students can start thinking about their choices. The only thing they're, they're, we're, we're debating here is whether, you know, the advanced and honors will be combined in one class. We're still offering both. So the stu students still have to choose, um, but we're just not sure of the delivery method. Mr. McCarthy. I just wanted to clarify something. Um, I recognize that these are, you know, the three freshman classes that we are discussing changing from um, honors and advanced split to heterogeneous. Um, but I do want to make clear, this is something we have done over the last many, at least the last 10 years across disciplines, across subjects in other areas. Now, granted, many of them are electives, but some of them like English are graduation requirements. So I just wanted to make sure it's clear. It's not something we're just, you know, uh, it's not something that we just did right now. These courses, obviously, these three courses that we're talking about, um, they are a change from last year, which we use this year, and we'd be looking to use next year. I just want to make sure that was clear. And Mr. McCarthy, just for myself, a student, as it, it happens as Mr. Cardin described, a student would pick whether they wanted to be in honors or not at the outset, correct? They're not making in-flight decisions about, well, if I do this assignment, I'll be in honors. And if I don't, I won't. They have to make that decision from the beginning. So our process is in the first day of school, our first day of class, the teacher lays out the syllabus, the expectations for the class, and then says, if you're interested in honors level credit for this course, here is the addendum to that syllabus that you would need to complete. The students are usually given one week to two weeks to have conversations with their teachers and make that decision for a year long course. And so part of that is students can come in, they can see all of their courses, see what the requirements would be for all of their courses and pick and choose which ones they're gonna take at the honors level. Thank you, that's helpful. All right, any more discussion on um, Mr. Schlickman's motion? All right, seeing none, um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. All right, so we will see you um, in the curriculum instruction subcommittee after uh, February break, Mr. McCarthy. May I ask for clarification? Yep. So at that meeting, from my understanding, you would obviously I will be there. Um, would you like would you like the department heads of these three departments to be present or at least to have a statement if they cannot attend? Yes, I think that would be very helpful. Okay. And Mr. Thielman had asked for a teacher or two. Uh, I can't guarantee that, obviously, but I can try to get a teacher or a department head. Um, and I will try to collect the data from parents and students in regards to this and get it to you. Uh, Prior to the meeting, I, you know, obviously with vacation, I will try, but that's my understanding of what the expectation is at this time. And then I can also publish the program of studies currently at, in this draft that you have with the notation that there are possibly some changes coming. And I will note out those changes based upon this conversation. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey and then Mr. Hainer. Just to be clear, um, are we, is block scheduling going to be discussed at that meeting or is that going to wait? To clarify, I block scheduling hasn't really even been discussed with our teachers yet. Okay. We are in the process of collecting data. I, I would not be prepared next week to discuss that or in two weeks. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, thank you. Mr. Hainer. Mr. McCarthy, I don't mean to add more to your table, but is it possible to get some input from students that have already gone through this program? 
you mean the, the heterogeneous process? Yes. Yes, that would be my goal, would be to collect information from the students and the parents. And if possible, the, a spectrum, the good, the bad, and the ugly. If you could. Oh, no, of course. Hmm. Thank you. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't polish it all up. Don't worry, you'll, you'll get the data. Thank you. Mr. Thielman? I just want to clarify the time of the curriculum meeting on the 24th. I have scheduled for three o'clock. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Seeing none. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, school reopening plans. Um, and this is something that um, one of the people who spoke at public comment mentioned that this would be a sort of recurring agenda item. Yes, it is. Um, so that affords us an opportunity to uh, have discussions amongst the committee about this and understand where, um, where we're at and get updates from the administration on what their plans look like. As most of you know, we cannot have conversations or meetings about this um, outside of our public meetings. So this is, uh, you know, we're all getting updated in real time. Um, so on this topic, so I know that Mr. Thielman sent um, something out by email. Mr. Thielman, do you want to start with that so that we have something yeah. to discuss on this topic? Sure, I think just first of all, I empathize uh, completely with all of the speakers tonight. Um, <clears throat> I think we start by getting a report from the superintendent and her staff on planning and discussions uh, that are taking place about um, bringing more students back to school. Um, so I, I did, had a conversation with Dr. Bodie and she uh, said to me that, you know, reopening is probably not the right title uh, because the schools are open. It's uh, about expanding in-person learning. And so um, that's the turn that's in the motion. So I, I have a motion uh, asking for reports from the district and I'll just read it. Move that the school committee request the superintendent to provide the following reports by no later than Thursday, March 11th. So it's the meeting one month from today. Uh, one, a written report on options and planning taking place to expand in-person instruction during the current 2021 school year for students at the district's lowest grade levels. And then two, a written report on options and planning taking place to expand in-person instruction during the current 2021 school year for students at each level, K-5, grade six, grade seven and eight, grade nine through 12. Once Arlington, Pools, Arlington Public School staff who teach and work with students have the opportunity to complete a full COVID-19 vaccine regimen. So once there's a second, I'll just speak as to I'll second the motion. Okay. Uh, so the, you know, the first to clarify, so for the first one, it's what can we do regardless of whether uh, a vaccine is available for, for students at the lowest grades? Um, doesn't specify which ones, whether it's K1, 2, 3. Um, we leave that up to the superintendent and her staff to report back on, on what's possible. All of us have heard about districts that have opened uh, school for all students uh, in the earlier grades. Um, we'll let the superintendent come back to us with what's possible in the earlier grades in Arlington. The second one is very specifically, what is the plan once uh, our, our teaching uh, and school staff who work with students have the opportunity to complete a full uh, vaccine regime, uh, regimen? Um, <clears throat> so I think this gives us a timeline. It um, gives the superintendent to and through the 11th to uh, give us a report, which we can talk about in that meeting. And then after, during that meeting, we can then delegate it to one of the committees, obviously probably the, the uh, curriculum subcommittee to, to go into, uh, to have further discussions. So that's my position. All right, uh, comments on uh, discussion, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I would request the motion be divided, uh, and I will tell you why. First of all, I'm very, very encouraged by what the president said today in that they've arranged to purchase another 
100 million doses of vaccine and that there will be enough vaccine by the end of summer to fully vaccinate 300 million Americans. And in a nation of 330 million people, that puts us in a position where I think we are firmly headed toward uh, reopening full in-person learning in September. Now, the question then becomes, uh, how do we expand uh, opening schools uh, this year? And in one way, the two motions are duplicative in that we've got to report on lower grades and then report specifying the various levels uh, that would be described, K-5, grade 6, 7, 8, and 9 through 12. Now, the only difference between them is that the second motion has an underlying assumption that everybody's had an opportunity to complete a full COVID-19 vaccine regimen, which in my mind is sort of, is quite important in terms of moving forward for expanding opening. Because right now what is limiting our ability to open is in part uh, maintaining six feet social distancing. Uh, and the reason why we have so few positives among the teaching staff is we've been able to restrict the number of students there in contact with on any given day through the week. Uh, bringing people closer together with more kids is going to increase the risk. Now, how much it is, I can't model that out, but given the fact that vaccinations are accelerating, and Dr. Fauci said today that by April, anyone who wants a vaccine should be able to get one, uh, we should be in a position by the end of April to have met the criteria stated in motion two. So that I would like to see what a plan for expanding opening would be, uh, should we meet that threshold, which I think is attainable uh, this spring. So I would like to divide the motion. I would vote against motion one, but I would very strongly support motion two as being the most realistic scenario for us moving forward uh, with expanded openings. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. So I'm, I'm supportive of the, of the motion. I, I'm, I might have gone with different wording, but um, it's not that important. Um, I, I, the, the intent of the CIA meeting, CIAA meeting on the 24th was actually to start the discussion about um, a plan for a plan. Um, and I think my, my reluctance, my, my, not reluctance, my issue with the, the wording of the motion uh, is, is that it's sort of what had happened with our high school, right? We asked for a plan. The plan was we can't do anything. We can only do remote. So I, I think, you know, as a school committee, we need to be more specific. And, and right now it's, it's a tiny bit premature. The CDC is coming out with new guidelines tomorrow. Um, there, there have been several districts that have moved to the three foot spacing for students, um, but hopefully we'll have more guidance on that tomorrow. Um, so, I, and my understanding is that the principals have been, the elementary principals have been talking about different options. So, so I think um, this is a good first step, but I do think we'll need to go further. And, and you know, as Mr. Schlippen sort of indicated, specifically direct that we expect a plan to move to full in-person at certain levels when certain criteria are met. And we're not ready to, part of the, the purpose of the CIAA committee is to be more specific, to develop more specific um, criteria for that and, 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 more, and have a, a tighter guidance for the administration from the school committee, um, but we're not quite ready yet. So this is a, a good first step, but I, I do expect uh, as a CIAA chair, Hopefully by the next meeting, maybe maybe not till. Um, hopefully by the next meeting to have more specific guidance on what we're expecting. I mean, so you know, yes, the teachers are vaccinated, but the kids aren't. So what does that mean for lunches? 
What does that mean for families who are currently like the hybrid, but aren't comfortable having their kids in a room with, with 20 kids instead of 10? What does it mean for the kids that are in the remote program who were in the remote program because they didn't like the hybrid, but if they get to be in person four days a week, want to opt into that? There's, there's lots of huge issues that um, we should be working on right now. Um, and uh, I think as a committee, we sort of need to guide that conversation so that we get a product that we, we, we want um, and not a, you know, sorry, we, we have to stay this way for the, end of, for the rest of the year. So I will, I will support the motions, uh, at, whether divided or not. Um, and I do look forward to, to being more, more granular on it in, in the future with the will of the, com the committee. Thanks. Dr. Alice Nampi. Thank you. Um, I'll support this motion, but I wanted to make some comments so that they're heard and hopefully taken into consideration at the CIA meeting and going forward. Um, my concern with, I, I understand the desire to have students, especially in our younger grades, return to school. And if everything had held constant as it's been with our testing and all, um, I think we would be in a good position to uh, move forward. My concern is about the COVID variants that are starting to surface. Um, a couple quotes, Dr. Fauci is concerned that the British B117 variant could become the dominant present in the US by the end of March. Um, it's 50% more infectious than the strain that has been here. Another person, Michael Osterman, who is um, out of the, who's the head of the Center of Infectious Disease Research Policy at the University of Minnesota, says a surge is likely to occur with this new variant from England. It's going to happen in, next, in the next six to 14 weeks. And so I feel like we can change the, the virus changing is kind of like adding more students to the room. And I know this isn't happy talk and I'm sorry, I'm always Debbie Downer here, um, but it's something that we also need to be aware of. And so I would very much hope that any conversations are made with the consultation and um, information provided from our health department, because I think these things should also be informing how we make our decisions. You know, I think with how things have been going, I think we're okay doing continuing what we're doing. Um, but I am not sure in the setting of these variants, whether now is the time to bring kids, bring more kids back into the classroom. Um, but I also haven't had a chance to talk to our um, Board of Health or, or anyone about this. So that's, I would hope that the, um, that APS is, does this as they create plan. Thank you. Ms. Exton. Okay, Ms. Um, so I, I will also be supporting the motion as it is, or um, if it's divided. Um, I think I agree with Mr. Cardin though. I, I, there are a lot of layers that whether that's something we ask for in a CIA subcommittee meeting or um, add to them. And then, um, I mean, I think one of the things that I think we need to think about is can we bring some of the younger grades back maintaining the six feet distancing? And we haven't gotten a report on current class sizes and what class, are there available classrooms for teachers who are teaching in the remote academy where we could space out students um, at six feet and still bring some of our younger students back. Um, I appreciate the optimism from, from some of you about the vaccine, but it just feels like it keeps getting pushed off and pushed off for teachers. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a really, it's essentially a five week process from the first shot to being um, completely protected from the virus. And so if we don't start making a plan now, when it starts rolling, we need to be ready in five weeks to, to be able to bring students back. So I think that, you know, making a plan sooner rather than later is, is really important, even if it's something that is ready to go and we can't implement until 
a date to be determined later. Um, I think it's going to be really important to, as others have mentioned, to get a survey from families based on what would their intentions be if students came back at six feet, if students were going to come back at four feet. Um, and with regard to the variance, we have the pool testing for the students. It's going to continue. And so hopefully we'll start to see if, if there's a big uptick in cases that's going to give us information about whether COVID um, is in our schools. I think one of the things I think a lot about, and, and I am in schools with students every single day. So I'm, this is something I'm doing too, um, you know, with these negative results is it's not that it's not spreading because of our mitigation factors necessarily, but it's just not there. And so we need to be aware of if it's there and we have these protective factors, it's not, then is it not spreading? So that testing, um, you know, is going to be a big piece of, of the data for us. Um, and then finally, you know, I want to know how the teachers feel about this. I, I know that there are some teachers who are eager to have their students back um, full in person. Hybrid is really, really challenging. Um, I know others are feel very differently. And so I think another piece of this plan and the report back needs to be what are what are teachers expectations and what do they need um, in order to feel safe? Is it more PPE? Is it to maintain six feet? Um, so I, I will support the motion, but I think we need a lot of, of information. Thanks. All right, any more discussion on um, Mr. Thielman's motion? Mr. Thielman, are you amenable to splitting it as- yeah, I'm, I'm fine with dividing the motion. Um, I, I urge members to vote for both one and two. One of the reasons why number one is there is because, and I, I have yet, and I've asked, um, you know, I've asked in conversations outside of this room with uh, leadership of the district um, for an explanation as to why given the staffing that we have, the classrooms that we have available, why we couldn't bring back kindergartners now with TAs and teachers. And so, and no one has given me an explanation. So I decided the best thing to do was to put number one in here and uh, just say lower, lowest grades or lower grade, lowest grades, um, so that we can get a report on that conversation taking place about students in the lower grades, particularly kindergarten. That's why it's there. And Mr. Thielman, I um, I have been asking since um, the 5th of December for a class size report that would give us a sense of how many students are in our in-person classrooms. And that has um, been very hard to produce apparently, um, but I think maybe we need a little more. Um, so I, I don't know if that's something, maybe I can ask for a third motion around that, that we could tie that in to March 11th, but that seems like information we really, um, we really need to have, and and I have not been successful at procuring it for this committee. So, um, I'm I'm you know I I defer to all of you if that is something that you would like. Um, but I think we may need to request that more formally at this point. So I, I would suggest we we divide the question. We vote on one, two, and then Lynn writes number three. Okay. I, I can I can propose an option for number three if somebody okay. would move it as well. So I, I know what I want. I just okay. haven't been able to get it. So. I didn't mean to imply. I didn't mean to imply. I just meant he could. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, more uh, discussion on uh, Mr. Thilman's motions that we will be taking in order. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, I I think that uh, the chair's request and Mr. Thielman's request as, as well of the current status of hybrid instruction and the number of kids who are in the room at any given time across the district is an important part of the motion under number two. So that should come with it. And uh, if we want to make that more explicit with a subsequent motion, I would favor that. All right, any more discussion on Mr. Thielman's motions? All right, seeing none, uh, Mr. Thilman, would you read for us, please, the first, we're gonna vote on the first piece. Yep. Move that the school committee request the superintendent provide the following report by no later than Thursday, March 11th, 2021, a written report on options and planning taking place to expand 
in-person instruction during the current 2021 school year for students at the district's lowest grade levels. Great, thank you. So on that motion, um, Mr. Hainer, are you still willing to second, to be the second on both pieces? Yes, I am. Okay, all right, uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. No. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. All right, um, and then Mr. Thielman, will you read the second part of your motion, please? Yeah, by the way, the way I said, the reason why I said Mr. Cardin should write the third motion is because he was critical of the language in this one. So I said, let him, let him write something. Oh, we'll see, I'll, I'll put something out there and okay. we'll see. Yeah, I think yeah. we can provide feedback as, as yeah. we all can. So, okay. Um, move to the school committee request the superintendent to provide the following report by no later than Thursday, March 11, 2021. A written report on options and planning taking place to expand in-person instruction during the current 2021 school year for students at each level, K-5, grade six, grade seven and eight, grades nine through 12. Once Arlington Public School staff who teach and work with students have the opportunity to complete a full COVID-19 vaccine regimen. All right, uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Hainer? Yes. I am also yes. Um, so I would uh, entertain if anybody feels so inclined a motion directing the superintendent to provide by March on March 11th as part of the aforementioned report, a class size report indicating how many students we have in hybrid and remote classrooms broken down by school. Does anybody want to make that I'll move? Is Second. There okay. Discussion. Dr. Allison Ampey and then Ms. Exton. I'm fine with that. Um, you might want to say how big the hybrid classes are, I mean, you know, who, how many are actually in a person, but the other thing I realized is should we be saying the superintendent or her designee on all of these? Sure. Sorry, I didn't think of it until now. Yep. Yes, I, I was envisioning the sort of typical class size report that we have gotten historically that we used to get every month that told mm -hmm. us how many kids were in each classroom. But um, we received one back in October. The challenge is, is that it's impossible from the report to determine which of those classrooms are remote and which of them are hybrid in person. So that was the information that I've been looking for. Um, Ms. Exton and then Mr. Schlickman. Just want to clarify, it, it's by school and by grade and by class. Like it's all of them. Yeah. All of that. Okay. School grade classroom. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, so to clarify, I'd like to see for any grade level, all the uh, classes that are operating on the AA block and the enrollment, all the classes that are operating BB and the enrollment, and all the uh, all the fully rem all the remote academy classes, uh, so that. Uh, if, for example, at the down, there were four uh, fourth grade teachers that we would see th that classrooms count of AAs and BBs separately, so that for four teachers, we'd end up looking at eight sets of numbers. Then in addition to that, we'd have a, uh, a count of how many classes we have that are fully remote and the class size of the fully remote cohorts assigned to the teacher. So that's what I'm envisioning. I think that's what you're envisioning too. It is. The other piece of information we'd need though, however, Mr. Schlickman, is that there's the AA cohort and there's the BB cohort. Mm -hmm. And they are, they're a Venn diagram because then there are these, there are these, there, there are quite a few, there's like three, four, five in each class that are both AA and BB, right? So our so mm -hmm. so the sum of AA plus BB does not equal the sum of the class. It is, it's it's double counting. Actually, I mean, we quite, you know, we have a number of students who are four days, four day a week students, right? You, you, however, it's represented, but, you know, to know 
how that divides up, how many AAs, how many BBs, and how many four, uh, four days are in there. Because that, that'll really give us a sense of, uh, of, of what we're looking at and where we can look to expand and where, it, where there are difficulties. All right. Anybody else on this? All right. Um, so motion by Mr. Hayner, second by Mr. Cardin um, on the class size report. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. I am also yes. Um, so I, I'm going to come to you and just, uh, so Mr. Hayner, go ahead. And then I want to- I just wanted to ask uh, the chair if this is an appropriate time uh, to seek something that I've been looking for for a couple of months with regard to the curriculum, or should I hold off? Um, is it related to reopening school? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, if it's a request, yes, go ahead. Uh, I move that the school committee request the superintendent and or her designee provide a copy of the curriculum audit by Dina Williams to all members of the school committee. Is there a second? Second for purpose of discussion. Thank you. If I may. Uh, Go ahead, Mr. Hare. I have been told several times when talking about this that it's just raw data and stuff. With the school department has had this in their hands since uh, mid fall. I'd like to see it. Uh, I am not going to make any judgments on it. I just want to see it, and I think it's important that we have it. All right. Anybody else? Uh, discussion on Mr. Hainer's motion. Mr. Thielman. Repeat the wording of the motion again, Mr. Hainer. Or Ms. Morgan. Go ahead, Mr. Hainer. Thank you. I'm asking the superintendent or the designee to provide us a copy of the curriculum audit that we asked for that the school committee at the school department has from Dina Williams to each member of the school committee. The staff is, my understanding is the staff is now, it has been working on it for the past couple of months. All right, others, Mr. Cardin. But just to clarify, this is the equity audit or what? what, what yes, yes, thank you. Okay. And uh, Dr. McNeil, was there a written report that, that, that fits this description? Yes, uh, it was a SEL equity audit, uh, and it's Dr. Dina Simmons. So okay. I apologize. Thank you. No worries. Great. Thanks. All right. Any more discussion? I would just ask that correction for the name of the person that did the audit be put into the minutes. Thank you. All right. Seeing no more discussion, uh, motion by Mr. Hainer. Uh, second by Dr. Allison Ampey. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Carden? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. I am also yes. Okay. Um, I have a quick question. Was there a date on that? What was the date? I'd like it as soon as possible. I mean, I, I'm you don't have to kill yourself to do it, but. Uh, no, 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 I'm just, I'm just, yeah. I just want to be like, you made a motion and I just. Wanted... I did, I did not put a specific date on it. I, okay. I, I didn't okay. want to put that extra pressure. Thank you. No worries. So why don't, the, since the motion was directed to the superintendent, Dr. McNeil, why don't you confer with her um, and, and go from there. And, uh, Absolutely. and if, okay. if for some reason it isn't forthcoming, I am uh, happy to follow up with both with, with, with her. I will follow up with her. Okay. All right. Um, any more discussion on um, school around school reopening? So I, I would just like to share, you know, I think that these conversations are really important. I think they can be um, challenging. I, um, I, you know, I see a path. Um, I see a path forward through um, Mr. the CIA subcommittee meeting. Um, I think that there could be uh, additional uh, direction 
either in the form of feedback or motions. We meet again as a, while we have a, a holiday break next week, we do still keep our two week schedule as a full committee. So we'll be back again um, in two weeks. So um, Mr. Schlickman and then Mr. Cardin. Yeah, just, just as a uh, point, well, two points of order. The first point of order is uh, Mr. Thielman's sound uh, is weak and I would hope that he could reposition his microphone or something so he becomes a little more audible. Uh, the second one is it was mentioned in public comment about whether or not we meet in person or not. And uh, I recall that when we were doing our superintendent interviews, we went to the uh, health department and the town specifically told us we will meet remotely until uh, there's a townwide decision on how boards and commissions are meeting. So uh at this point uh that's where the, the the first decision comes in once they open things up then we can make a decision on how we're going to meet but at this point we are uh a town committee and we will follow the uh dictates of the town right and one other comment I, you know I, this is something that i've given a lot of thought to um i don't have I don't have reservations about meeting in person, um, but I, there are real significant logistical challenges around the technology and having multiple laptops. I have I have twins that are uh, at the Gibbs and they're in the same class, which is good and safer for everybody, safer for their teachers, which we're happy to support. Um, but they also share a room because we live in a small house and even just the two of them being on a class meeting concurrently, the feedback from just their laptops that are next to each other, they're constantly, I, I constantly have to separate them because they hear the, if you have your speakers on, you're hearing a, a perpetual echo. And, you know, I had, I have talked to a lot of people who run these kind of meetings. I had considered um, just bringing in the committee um, into the high school building and having everybody else on Zoom, which is something that the, um, you know, that if if we worked with that with the town, that the town council thought was possible, um, we would be in a situation where we would be perpetually uh, muting our microphones and the speakers on our laptops so that we could actually speak and hear each other. And, and it literally feels like an echo chamber. So while I um, am, and potentially never going to, to run an in-person meeting as chair, which I would very much like to do. Um, I, you know, there, there are real logistical challenges to doing it. The other issue is, is that our meetings are so, um, you know, we, we, we only meet every two weeks, which um, I never thought I would say was not often enough, but, um, you know, we, we get into situations, and I talked about this with um, the Director of Health and Human Services, where you come to a situation where it's very hard to get a quorum in the room, or it can be. Um, for example, this week, my daughter was quarantined from exposure at the Audison, and while I could be out in the world, um, I would have been reticent to come to you know, a, an in-person meeting where I was anywhere near anybody else, um, just because it, it seems like, um, you know, it just doesn't seem like a good idea, frankly. Um, so those are real challenges in terms of making sure that we get everybody in the space and then the technology is 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 tough because we would still need to afford public access and we would not be in a position where we could have, we have how many people on the screen right now? 12. Um, 12 of us would be, would be challenging um, in you know in, in a space with all of our our laptops blaring so it's certainly something that we've given a lot of thought to i actually don't think that our um our hesitation around doing it has a whole lot doesn't have to do with the the safety and um the safety pieces of it it has a lot more to do with just the um the the technology of making it happen and making sure that our meeting is available to the public so um Dr. Allison Ampey, go ahead. And then Mr. Cardin. I just wanted to point out that the leadership and modeling that we are doing is to follow the local health directives, which is what we've been doing. And um, that is something I think a lot of us have wished had been happening all along at all levels of our government. Mr. Cardin. 
Thanks. So I just wanted to address um, the parent question about you know what they can be doing to support uh, moving to more in-person learning. You know what what Cambridge is doing is is they're shifting to three feet separation. The, the faculty is six feet away, but the children are three feet. So I I think we need to have a conversation. The parents need to start having a conversation with their peers, um, particularly after tomorrow, depending on what the CDC says. If the CDC does come out with that recommendation that three feet is sufficient. Um, there needs to be a conversation about whether the, whether the parents uh, in general are, are comfortable moving towards that because it's going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to offer, to give options of or six feet or three feet. I mean, Cambridge isn't doing that. It just logistically would be a nightmare. So start talking with your fellow parents, um, particularly after tomorrow, if, if that's the recommendation, um, because we, we, we need some consensus that three feet is going to be okay. Um, because the kids aren't going to have the vaccine this year. Thanks. All right. Anybody else on this agenda item? All right. Seeing none. Um, the second reading on the 2021-2022 school calendar um, vote to approve. Dr. McNeil, do you have a recommendation as uh, Dr. Bodie's designee this evening? Yes. Um, thank you, Ms. Morgan. So looking at the calendar, um, we are making the recommendation and it's in regards to the first day of school. Um, just to give context, there was a conflict with the Jewish holiday Rosh Hashanah. And uh, we heard from many parents during the um, policy and procedures subcommittee. Um, and so we are making the recommendation that the first day of school be changed. Uh, to September 9th. And then we're going to move our professional development day that's normally in, uh, in November to September 8th. And so with the if we have the five snow days that will put us at the last day of school would be June 29th. So that's what uh, on behalf of Dr. Bodie, I'm making that recommendation to the committee. Great. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Um, do uh, so I, I guess I'm looking for a motion on the uh, calendar. Mr. Schlickman? Uh, before we adopt the recommended calendar, uh, I just want to insert the other component of the calendar. Uh, uh, so I move that pursuant to po school committee policy BEA, it is voted that the Arlington School Committee schedule 19 regular meetings for the 2021-22 school year, which shall begin promptly at 6.30 p.m. on the following date, September 9, September 23, and the list is in Novus, so I won't read them all. Uh, the approved school committee calendar shall be distributed to all principals and administrators with instructions that every effort shall be made to avoid scheduling evening events on school committee meeting nights. That language is taken from our policy uh, and will establish the 19 meeting dates that are on the calendar and by our policy we're required to make this vote. Uh, is there a second for Mr. Schiffman's motion? Second. Um, discussion. So I'm, I have one point of clarification and then, but I, more importantly, um, thank you, Mr. Schlickman, for talking about the um, endeavoring to not schedule school events on our school committee nights. I have missed um, meetings every year that I have been a school committee member because uh, you know, there's always a school that schedules their back to school night on our meeting night. Um, so it would be really great if, uh, and again, we're, I know people are doing their best and back to school nights are tough to schedule. Um, and I have kids at a lot of different schools, so that makes it even more challenging, but um, it's, it's, it's really tough. I'm, I'm, I, for some reason, I feel really okay about missing a school committee meeting to go watch my daughter saw away on her violin. That seems sort of reasonable, but I, I get really frustrated when back to school nights are scheduled um, and they conflict. And it also means that the parents from those schools also can't attend our meetings. So thank you for um, clarifying that, Mr. Schlickman. Did you happen to look, and I can, well, if others are commenting, I believe that the dates that are in the draft for calendar that are in Novus are, have taken 
the meeting dates that you provided, but I will admit that I did not reconcile them. So I think we should probably just approve your dates and approve the calendar just in case they don't line up. Well, they do line up, but the uh, but our policy, which includes that language regarding notifying principles of the calendar, da 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 da, is in our policy. Okay. And our policy requires us as a committee to select our 19 dates. Outstanding. So, so that's why this motion is being made before we adopt the calendar, uh, because that's sort of a prerequisite to having the dates on the calendar. That's all. It's, it's purely procedural. Great. So uh, any more comments on the school committee meeting uh, dates that Mr. Schlickman provided? Seeing none, uh, let's vote on those. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Curtin? Yes. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Um, all right, is there a motion to approve the 2021-2022 uh, calendar? As so moved. By Dr. McNeil on behalf of Dr. Bodie. Um, so moved. Mr. Schickman, second by Mr. Thielman. Discussion? Mr. Schickman? I'm just reporting out that on a motion by Mr. Heiner, seconded by Dr. Alice in Nampi, it was voted uh, by the uh, Policies and Procedures Committee to recommend that the full committee at their meeting tonight uh, vote to have the first day of school on Thursday, September 9th. So this uh, calendar before us is consistent with the recommendation of the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee. Great, further discussion. Seeing none, let's vote. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Curtin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. That was much louder, Mr. Thielman. We absolutely heard your enthusiastic yes. Uh, Mr. Hayner? Yes. And I am also yes. OK. Uh, Mr. Schlickman? OK. Uh, we have a motion, another motion from the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee. Uh, we recommend that the Arlington School Committee adopt the following statement and send it to Senator Cindy F. Friedman, Representative Sean Garbley, Representative David M. Rogers, Governor Charles D. Baker Jr., Education Commissioner Jeffrey C. Riley, and the members of the Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. The statement is as follows. Over the past year, the Arlington Public Schools partnered with its teachers to develop expertise and resources for successful remote learning. The district has provided extensive professional development for our professional staff, and our teachers have devoted considerable hours of their time to master best practices for remote learning. Thanks to the hard work and dedication of our educators, Arlington has demonstra demonstrable success in providing high quality remote instruction for our students. While there is no substitute for in-person teaching, we believe that successful remote instruction during snow closures can be preferable to extending the school year in June. Recognizing our teachers and students' proficiency in remote instruction, the Arlington School Committee requests the amendment of state law or Department of Elementary and Secondary Education regulations to permit districts to choose to conduct a full credited day of remote instruction when the district would otherwise close schools due to inclement weather. There a second for Mr. Schlickman's motion. Second. Second by Mr. Hainer. Uh, discussion? Ms. Exton? I just, I wanna clarify or make sure I understand that this is just a request um, for it to be an option and not that Arlington is necessarily going to automatically use snow days for remote teaching instead of an actual snow day. Mr. Schiff, uh, would you like yes, to that is absolutely correct. Uh, right now, we do not have the option. Uh, whether we exercise it or not is one we would want to set a policy on, but we can't set a policy of whether we want to go for a remote snow day or not. If we're not permitted to. So this would only give us an option to do something which we might want to do. 
So, and my, so my, my questions or concerns were the same as um, Ms. Exton's and I actually addressed them with Dr. Bodhi um, earlier this week, because, you know, as we know, we did a remote snow day um, and then we got some feedback, especially for some of the elementary educators, it was exceptionally challenging. And so we pivoted to having what she called a traditional snow day. I don't really know what that is, but like a snow day where we don't do remote school, I guess we could call it. Um, and so I, um, I was concerned about this motion initially, but I appreciate the intent of it and, and I'm absolutely gonna be supporting it because um, I like having choices too. Um, but I think that if we're going to move in this direction or another, that we need to um, get some, you know, get some feedback, not only, you know, from, from our, um, our teachers and staff sort of writ large in aggregate in the form of some kind of a survey um, and also talk to the community and talk to parents um, and you know students maybe in the upper grades about what they would like to see because I think you know we haven't had a chance to do that which I think is fine and appropriate um, but I agree with Mr. Schlickman that it would be premature to solicit all of that feedback in an effort to make the best decision for Arlington if Desi told us that we can pound sand so um that so I'm 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 good with doing this, um, but I agree with Ms. Exton that we have, we have a lot of work to do. Um, should we be given this this the option to do so? Um, all right. Any more discussion on this from the committee on Mr. Schlippen's motion? Seeing none. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Dr. Alison Ampey. Sorry, technical difficulties. Yes. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Heiner? Yes. And I am also yes. Okay, any more? We we are flying through our motions tonight, guys. I don't think we've ever voted this many times. Uh, any more motions on the calendar are related to the 2021-2022 school calendar? All right, seeing none. Um, we are going, the next item on the agenda um, is uh, going to be brought to us by the triad of Dr. McNeil, Ms. Bird, and Ms. Rodriguez, who we saw two weeks ago. They presented um, the Panorama Family Survey results, and they are back here tonight um, with some follow-up um, and clarification. So Dr. McNeil, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Um, so yes, we we are coming back, and I I'm saying that this came out of my reflection on the questions that were asked, you know, as we were presenting the data, and then we had our discussion, and I wanted to come back, and I wanted to just talk about some of the things that are going on in the district that can that are not necessarily, you know, taking place in direct response to the data, but these are things that we're you know we have planned on. Uh, implementing throughout the year in, in, in order to create a foundation. And so some, in order to address some of the things that were brought up in the data. And we, and I'm just saying like, the reason why I'm presenting this is because that these foundational things, these initiatives that we've done that we're focusing on like SEL, um, cultural awareness uh, and reaching out and, com to, and communicating with families, over time, I do believe that they will yield us the results uh, that we're looking for, and I know that the present pandemic is a huge prop is is a huge has had a huge impact on how some of those parents are responding, and that was actually the initial intention of giving out the survey to in order to get to understand what the experiences were of the various stakeholder groups. And I just want to again emphasize that we've given a survey out to staff, out to families, and we currently have a survey that we've sent out and we're in that survey window right now for our students in grades three to 12. So I'm gonna take a moment just to share my screen and I'm gonna go through a couple of slides and then um, Ms. Bird and Ms. Rodriguez will talk about some of these wonderful, just absolutely wonderful initiatives that they're working on um, that, are, that have a SEL focus. So I'm just gonna share my screen. And, and I will say that this, I, I didn't share the slide deck ahead of time because I wanted to provide a narrative 
uh, for the slide deck, but I will make it um, available to all school committee members once we give that narrative. And so you'll be able to look at the information with a certain um, level of context. So um, this is the part two. And again, these are things that we're gonna have to continue to do as we review the data, we analyze it, and we try to digest, digest it and understand what we need to do to respond to it. And so, let me see. So, you know, the objective for this slide deck is just to, first, I wanna present some assumptions to the community. So whenever we have these type of conversations that there's a certain level of understanding of what our objectives are from the school department. Um, and this is to respond some of, to some of the things that the parents have said uh, publicly. And I just wanna make sure that you know, the community is clear on what our intentions are as a district. And then to clarify some of the data points, I think um, a couple of data points as it related to the learning models, um, oops, sorry, that um, you know, they were taken out of context. And I also want to, uh, you know, correct an error in the data. And then we're gonna, you know, like I said before, we're just gonna highlight some of the initiatives. There's a many that are presented in the slide deck. We're not gonna go over every one, but we are gonna highlight some of the things that we are, are doing. And I think that will, like I said before, yield results. And, and I just want the community to know these are the things that we're doing. And then responding to some of those questions, like what are some of the immediate things that we can do to respond to the data? And what are some of the long, and I have to correct that, what are some of the long-term uh, initiatives that can be established to respond to the data? And really the slide deck is actually uh, presenting those long-term um, initiatives. So just looking at some of the assumptions, like I said, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I want, I want um, as we began this school year, we had a goal and one of the goal, uh, you know, as a, as a running goal is always to bring students back uh, as soon as we can, as soon as it's safe. And one of the things that I want the community to know, this is something that we continually talk about amongst ourselves. I think the, the comment was made that, you know, elementary principals talk about this. We have elementary principal meetings where I'm present, Dr. Bodie's present, and we talk about what, what can we do in order to bring uh, students back and that we currently at all levels are reaching out to students and families and trying to provide information as it relates to you know results from the pool testing you know letting parents know the impact that it's had on instruction and then reaching out to students and to students and the families of students that you know who are not engaging what can we do in order to you know get those students engaged and understanding what their experiences are and what are some of the barriers and challenges that they're facing uh, during this pandemic. So some of the just the data points from the survey, I think that when we talked about the learning behaviors, there was com some confusion. And it was, um, you know, it, there was some confusion. And I just wanted to provide some clarity as you know, to separate the two, we had a data point as it related to the learning behaviors. And we had a data point as it related to the learning models. Um, so I just wanna say that um, when we are looking at the learning behaviors, there was a national metric that was you know, inserted into that data point. And I did reach out to, and I sent, a, I sent a, uh, a memo or a message or email to all the school committee members, to all of you, to, to talk about that national bench or that national comparison. And I did reach out to uh, the Panorama representative that we work with. And I talked about, you know, whether or not it was an apples to apples comparison. So the other districts um, were not comparing the data that they received to other districts during the pandemic. Some of those districts uh, administered the survey pre-pandemic. So when it, when it looked at where we fell in the continuum of districts uh, nationally, it did, it, it made it, we looked at as if we were scoring in the bottom 10%. And that is uh, erroneous um, because we can't compare ourselves to uh, districts that administered the survey pre-pandemic because it's different conditions. So you're gonna, it's gonna yield a different response. So I just wanted to make sure that um, I identified those two, uh, you know, I clarified those, that data point. And then the second one, like I said before, that, um, that the learning behaviors 
were confused with learning models. And so, you know, they, we were talking about the experience that's, that, that students were having or, or families were having with the different learning models. And it, does, it didn't necessarily talk about the quality of the learning models that we are implementing for students. So I just wanted to make sure that we were, that I clarified that. Um, so just some of the things that we have, you know, going on within the district and as it relates to cultural awareness, uh, which was one of the components of the survey. So over the past two years, um, we have trained over 70, actually 76 staff, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm making that adjustment because some of the staff that we trained, we actually trained actually 80 and I, and I confirmed some of this today, like right before this, so I didn't have to correct this in there, but this data point that we've trained over 76 staff have taken the ideas one uh, anti-racism racism course. And right now we're looking how we can leverage that, that knowledge and that experience and how they, be, they can share their knowledge with the rest of the district and, and become facilitators. So uh, we have a time that we're going to meet with those individuals that took the ideas course and talk about you know, their experience and how they're applying it to their, their instructional practice. And we have administrators and staff that have taken and um, instructional staff that have taken that course. So I'm very proud of that fact because we are offering it, you know, every quarter. So we have that course, and it's a it's a 25 hour course, and uh, and it's very rigorous. And uh, staff can also get two graduate credits through Framingham State um, based upon the work that they do um, from taking that course. And I'm not going to go through all the rest of them, but I, I listed the other points there. So I just like, you know, and in, in um, observance of time, I just want, I put those in there, but I'm not going to necessarily uh, talk about those things. But this is one thing that I'm very proud of uh, that we we're able to do because we're doing the training. We're trying to um, make sure that we're uh, exposing uh, various uh, staff members to this experience, this learning experience. And I think it's gonna, in the long run, it's gonna help us and it's gonna help us reach our goal of uh, becoming a anti-racist district and employing anti-racist instructional practices. And then, and then this is like seeping into what we're doing, some of the discussions that we have in our curriculum leaders meeting. We had the audit, uh, we're talking about how we're integrating multicultural content and culturally responsive teaching practices into our instruction. And then one thing I'm very proud of at the high school, they've done a lot of work around this and we have an anti-working racist group of students who are meet with staff to talk about different aspects of the learning community and how they can implement anti-racist practices. So we talk about curriculum, um, I'm actually meeting with a group and we talk about how the students are developing a, a diversity, equity and inclusion uh, a web page that they can add to the web page that, um, that I've created for the district that has resources and articles and videos that um, students and staff can access uh, so they can you know, continue to advance their knowledge and understand you know, what it is to be to have a multicultural perspective. And then something that that we've shared out to the, to the entire district is the anti-racist working group uh, does a video newsletter that's just outstanding. And we share that out to the staff every, every month. Uh, some of the learning needs we have worked, uh, we got a federal grant part of the CARES Act and uh, from HUD uh, that we have a community block development grant. And we've been able to establish a tutoring program focusing on the needs of some of our most marginalized population and it's targets students from a, a lower socioeconomic background. Um, and so we've set that up and that goes, we started it uh, just a couple of like, around now, like last week, I believe. And then that's gonna go all the way to the end of the year. So that's some federal funding that we received and, and we started um, you know, this tutoring program. And I looked to see that you know, we're gonna, that's gonna yield some very, um, some very positive results for the students who need it. And then again, I list other things that's, that, that buildings are doing um, in order to set up tutoring programs uh, locally um, for students and trying to also hire staff to meet with students on the remote days. Outreach, you know, there's a, a lot of things listed here, but you know, as you can see, it's like emails, 
uh, outreach from you know staff to families, trying to keep families in, um, informed as to what's going on as it relates to uh, the COVID testing that we have going on throughout the, the, the school district. And then we started the pool testing. So we regularly report out those results to families and uh, you know, still reaching out to students and uh, trying to do our best to engage students and, and trying to work within the confines of the pandemic and um, you know, check in on students and see how they're doing. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ms. Bird and Ms. Rodriguez and they can talk about some of the things that we have going on and uh, building like a, a SEL, a, a strong robust SEL uh, program within the district and that, that covers many different aspects. And um, so I'm gonna turn it over to her. Thanks, Pam. Um, absolutely. So just taking a, a quick overview of these slides, and again, as uh, Rod mentioned, these will be available to folks. And then I, I also want to um, let folks know that if they just click on the SEL website for the district, they'll you'll be able to find all of this material there as well. So um, all of these hyperlinks are easily accessible there. Um, and I can share my screen later and show that to you all. Um, in addition. So the safe and supportive schools assessments that we have in place in the plan for the school year, um, you've already been familiarized with the panorama family student and staff uh, survey. So that's that's one piece of looking at school climate and the overall experience from all the different stakeholders. Um, as some of you may have had direct experience with um, or indirect experience with, we will um, in the near future be coming back to speak with you about the universal mental health screener that we've been doing also with students from uh, third grade through 12th grade. And this is a screener that takes a look at the individual mental health of all of our students to see how COVID's impacting them, but not COVID necessarily, but rather the overall milieu of just how is everyone functioning right now and hanging in there. And then what it does is it identifies individual students who may be moderately elevated or severely elevated in terms of being in distress and matches them um, with uh, a tier two or a tier three intervention and connects with their families and so on. So we've been doing a really beautiful rollout of that and we'll share more on that. Um, but that's a complementary assessment in terms of the mental health well-being, creating a safe and supportive environment across the district. And then the uh, third assessment in this uh, ecology of creating a safe and supportive school is how are our students doing in terms of learning social emotional learning skills and competencies. So when we teach them about things like self awareness and relationship skills, are they learning them? And how are we assessing those? And um, how well is our curriculum working? And do we have uh, teachers that could use some more support, um, perhaps better programming, perhaps better coaching? And where's our assessment cycle on that? And so we're actually working on a pilot with DESI to um, look at this assessment and this indicator to work with our student data and um, report back to students what their strengths are and help inform our instruction through that. So we'll definitely have the opportunity to come back and talk more about that, but we wanted to also provide a bit of the context of where Panorama sits in the larger scheme of how we're looking at mental health and social emotional learning and growth and instruction. Um, but also, as Rod mentioned earlier, to let you know what's been in the works uh, prior to the data coming back. You can go to the next one, Rod. Um, part of our plan that was put together before we returned takes these three concepts straight from Desi's guidance on how to return to positive environments. Overall, in a nutshell, they are really stressing the parity and interdependence of physical and emotional safety. So we spend so much time and energy and resources on, and you were all just discussing it earlier, you know, six feet versus three feet and making sure that everybody feels safe and that vaccines and testing are, are funded and um, provided for and that everybody has their needs met for physical safety. Are we having those conversations on an equal level funding level time and energy and same uh, ferocity of emotional energy and equity of access when we're talking about access to emotional safety. And that's one of the major th components that Desi was stressing. And so we try to take that into these plans as well. Similarly with equity and racial justice, we know that COVID has um, hit our BIPOC families and students and staff 
much more severely than it has for our um, non-BIPOC folks. And so we wanna make sure that anything we do with SEL is mindful of that and incorporates that as well. And then the last piece is collective care. Um, when we're talking about self-care, that may have been something that folks have heard about before. Uh, collective care is much more focusing, uh, kind of if you think of the idea of a conductor in front of an orchestra. Everybody needs to play their individual instruments. Every teacher has their individual class they need to play. Uh, but we had better all tune up together or the whole piece is a mess. If one or two people are out of tune, then it doesn't really matter. The whole movement, the whole piece sounds discordant. And so how do we look at self-care not as something that is selfish, but rather as something where we actually owe it to one another. We have to be looking at caring, not just for ourselves, but caring for one another. There is this concept of collective care that's necessary when our entire community has undergone something so drastic. And these all come from DESE. So we took all three of these principles into our SEL plan. Thanks, Rod. Uh, we also are majorly funded by a number of different avenues. Um, and one of them is the Arlington Education Foundation, as you all are very well familiar with the fact that we are in the midst of a multi-year $200,000 grant and they fund a number of things, which you'll see highlighted in green throughout the slides. The Department of Ed, we currently have three different grants operating with them um, that are funding a number of these programs. Um, the 613 grant is a one-year program that funds the mental health universal screening process I just described earlier and access to services um, and the interface contract. The, also, the grant 337 funds our Safe and Supportive Schools uh, continuation grant and mentoring. We mentor other districts in that. And um, grant 151 is the pilot program for the social emotional learning assessment of um, competencies. And then, as Rod mentioned earlier, the Chana 17, which is the community health network area, um, and we're the area 17, has given us a grant for a couple of years on access and equity and mental health, particularly for our Black and African American um, residents, so students and families. Um, and that's where the ideas funding has come from, as well as some cultural humility opportunities and so on. You can go to the next one, Rod. So uh, this is broken down into four areas. I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but um, like I had mentioned, all of these are hyperlinks that you'll be able to access on the website. It's under district SEL plan for 2020, 2021. Um, and these are all aligned with the castle plan to return in the fall. Um, and just to highlight for folks, CASEL is the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. It is the powerhouse and the authority when it comes to what is best practice and research and resources when it comes to sound evidence-based uh, social emotional learning structures and implementation. And if you notice when they, uh, if you get into the reading of it, when we were returning back to schools and they put out their their guidebook on how to do that, Arlington Public Schools is actually cited as one of two or three contributing districts in the entire nation because I helped to contribute to the authorship of this document. And so we should, um, I say that because we should feel excited that Arlington is actually one of the very few districts that is cited as a contributor to this document. And you can trust that we are entirely aligned with all of their efforts. So you can see everything here that's highlighted in green. Those are all grant funded. And you can notice that everything that's gone through here is well in action. So we have youth mental health first aid trainings. We've been looking at climate data. We've got that Panorama partnership up. We have an SASS council and advisory council with families. Um, we just had a, a recent meeting this past week, which has been awesome. And then we have equity questions that go along with every step of the way. Um, you can go ahead to the next one, Rod. Then the critical practice too is all about connecting with and supporting the adult social emotional learning. This is a space for connection and healing among adults. And so we have a wise at work contract this year, which actually allows all of our, all staff in Arlington to have an app on their phone about mindfulness and to learn about how to create peace 
and uh, well-being in their workplace. And some really great things have come from that. We've got some great stats on, you know, over 180 folks have signed on and have been using it. Um, mostly, I could say, to get some peaceful sleep. So folks have been using it to take care of their own health and well-being. Um, we also have a mental health and well-being website that hosts free webinars all the time and yoga classes and things for staff. We've also sent out um, the interface connection and the EAP and many resources for cultivating resilience and managing secondary trauma for our adults. Um, not to mention all of the SELPD that we had at the start of the year before we started up, as well as ongoing PLC or early release times coming up for elementary. You can go to the next one, Rod. Additionally, uh, one of the best PD opportunities that's embedded uh, is an opportunity that we have through the state where many of our schools are engaged in MTSS academies, multi-tiered systems of support academies. And we've got, as you can see here, Thompson, Bishop, Hardy, Gibbs, Brackett, all engaged in a variety of different learning opportunities. And these are all multiple years. They're three-year academies, mental health and social emotional learning, positive behavior interventions and supports and culturally responsive teaching. And they're really brilliant opportunities um, where they get outside coaching and um, wonderful internal coaching where they build up the capacity of the staff internally and it's embedded. So these are not one and done. These are ongoing um, chances for people to connect. We also continue to have the trauma courses from the Leslie Institute for Trauma Studies. And the interest in that has just continued to blossom considering that every student has now been experiencing this adverse childhood experience of COVID. So we're continuing to partner with Leslie and figure out how to bring them in even in this virtual setting. You can hit the next one, Rod. Um, critical practice three is then when you bring it to the students and you'll notice there's a lot here. Um, one thing I wanna highlight is this connection mapping that happens virtually. And I just spoke with some folks at Gibbs who um, have been using this and it's a brilliant way to identify which students have connections and relationships with different staff members across the building. Maybe they're not even folks that they see or interact with from a class, but maybe it's from a club or maybe it's just from being in the building a couple days a week. And what they do is they use that to identify where are the students that have very minimal connections and then how do they as a team go through and find those students and adopt a student or pick a student to say, okay, those are the kids that we're gonna intentionally connect with once every single day until we can now say, okay, that student has grown an additional adult connection or relationship at school. So now they have a solid connection. So the connection mapping is, is a really simple and very powerful tool to make sure kids are engaged and connected. Um, tons of resources and work happening with responsive classroom, responsive advisory. Um, also, RULER is a social emotional learning training and program that is happening for um, oh, Audison and at the high school, and it's quite complementary to all of the CPS work that's happening, um, as well as the responsive classroom structure that is at Gibbs. And so um, there's been a lot of conversation about how Gibbs is going to connect with that. So we're in the really good conversations and beginning steps of looking at that. Our elementary schools have been diving deeper into second step online, but also using the physical um, materials when they are in person. And then uh, Laura is going to talk a little bit more about our focus on the three um, areas for this year. So you can go ahead and kick it ahead, Rod, to the next slide. Um, you already talked about the ideas courses. So we'll go to the next one. And Laura is going to take critical practice four. All right. So for critical practice four, um, obviously using the data that we're collecting from all of these different surveys and then from um, assessments to really deepen those relationships um, and continuously work on improving both the social emotional learning capacity of our children, but then also our adults. Um, so again, in green is highlighted the grant work, um, but really that emphasis on elevating student voice and hearing what their experience has been. Um, so I've worked um, closely with one of the um, high school members who runs advisory, making sure that, okay, what is he hearing? What are the students saying? What has their experience been? Um, and really waiting for that data, de data to come in um, from Panorama to use that as well. Um, 
in regards to uh, supporting educators. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, point of order, please. Yes, Mr. Schlickman, go ahead. I move that we suspend policy BEDB regarding the limit of, uh, of presentations to extend for another five minutes. Um, okay, so motion by Mr. Schlickman, is there a second? Second. Second. All right. Uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Uh, Dr. Al Snampy? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. And I am also yes. All right. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ms. Rodriguez. So, um, Dr. McNeil, is do you, or Ms. Rodriguez, do you believe that your presentation will be more than five more minutes? No. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, so uh, essentially using that student voice, um, making sure that we're hearing from what their experience has been so then we can better inform decisions that we're making um, and tools that we're really giving to um, our educators and to our students. Um, so we can go ahead to the next slide. All right, so these were the competencies that we're really focused on for this school year. Um, so first we have our self-awareness competency and it's defined you know, as the ability to accurately recognize one emotions. Um, and then we also have a column for the skills that we need right now. Um, so as we're processing uh, the pandemic, racial injustice, uh, self-awareness for all of our students and our educators um, is really critical at this time uh, more than ever. Um, and so we're figuring out how we're able to embed that really intentionally into curriculum that's already happening within the school district and really using those PLC times um, as moments of reflection for our teachers um, to figure out, you know, how is this showing up in what's already being done and then how can we highlight it even further. Um, we have relationship skills as well. So the importance of building relationships, not only with their peers, but also with adults, um, particularly when we're in this remote world um, where everyone is experiencing this adverse um, trauma collectively. Um, and then finally, we have self-management. So the ability to regulate thoughts, behavior, stress, um, which we're seeing uh, is really critical in the ability to cope with grief, loss, uh, develop resiliency. Um, so these are three key areas of focus um, for this school year. Um, and if a lot of the work that we've been doing and will continue to do really highlight the importance of these three skills. That is all. At this point, we would just, on the, our last slide, Rod, is just um, questions. Yeah, and I want to go back and I just want to say that in the first slide, I, I skipped one about our values and these are things that we um, focused on for this year. And one of our main values that, that you know, we continue to uh, collect information on as we do our pool testing, but the, 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 the one of the values was the physical and mental health of all adults and students in the district. Um, and so I think that's something that we've done very well. And then equity and learning continues to be uh, a value. So teacher collaboration. So I just wanted to point that out that, you know, as we embarked on this year, we did work with teachers to come up with some guiding principles of what we needed to focus on as we knew that the impact of the pandemic would have a, would be severe. So, and also I wanna talk about, when you talk about planning for the fall, and you know, with the anticipation that students are going to come back and the trauma that they have experienced and the trauma that families have experienced, I think everything, when you talk about the planning, it goes beyond than, than just the physical bringing back of students. You got to provide a foundation from a multi-tier systems of support lens in order to understand what you're going to need to do in order to re re uh, you know, have the students come back and have them be reacclimated back into a learning environment. And we're gonna to have to do some work around that. So some of our students have been out of uh, school for many months, you know, um, by the time they go back in September, it'll be almost, I don't even know, 18 months, I think it is. And so we need to have these things in place. And this is part of the planning process. So any questions or comments? Well, we can take them right now. Thank you for your attention. And uh, thank you to Ms. Bird and Ms. Rodriguez for being a part of this uh, 
uh, presentation. Great, thank you so much. Um, questions from the committee or comments? Um, Mr. Cardin? Uh, thank you uh, very much for that. It, it's clear there's a lot going on in, in this area, but again, I would just ask um, for there to be a little bit more communication with the parents about all of this. Um, you know, I know there's the mental health survey, the individual survey that's being done at the high school. I think people are getting notification when that's occurring, but just sort of a, you know, a SEL newsletter or something, um, or, you know, a, just a special, a special correspondence you know, talking about how this is a tough year and these are all the things that we're doing, maybe not quite in this level of detail, but these are all the things that we're doing to, to try to, to, to ameliorate the, to the best we can. Um, and, and, you know, because we're, we're doing a lot, but people don't know about it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Card. Great, anybody else? Questions or comments, Dr. Allison Ampey and then Mr. Thiel. Thank you. Um, Dr. McNeil, I'd be especially interested in learning how you feel the needs as we're reintegrating students next year, how that's going to impact in terms of budget. Um, are we going to need additional staff or, or you know, is, is there anything that we can do to make it better? And if so, uh, how much money will it take? Oh, that's a great question. That, those are things that we considered as we, you know, uh, Mr. Mason will be presenting uh, the budget tonight. And so we did take that in consideration. We have non-staffing and staffing requests. Uh, we have definitely dedicated uh, funds towards, you know, the SEL curriculum materials that we'll need to do to carry through some of the items that uh, Ms. Bird uh, referred to, especially as it relates to second step and uh, making sure that teachers have what they need. But yes, uh, we can definitely uh, highlight what those things are and, and continue to think about that and uh, report back to you. Uh, but that's a great question. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thielman. My question is similar uh, to Dr. Allison Ampey's, uh, but I was actually, I'm assuming that as you were developing this uh, report, you were thinking of the number of staff that I'm going to need, or we're going to need to implement this. So, have there been discussions? I mean, forgetting the forgetting, you know, dollars, uh, but like, have there been discussions about? Well, I'm going to need this number of additional FTEs in order to do the work. I, uh, we, and I'll give you a quick example, and Miss Bird can also piggyback on this. So, you know, one of the things that were that, you know, one of the grants that was written as it related to the COVID-19 screener, it was like also thinking about not just thinking about administering the screener, but what is the infrastructure that we need in order to support uh, the whole process. So not only just administering the screener, but what is it going to look like when we interpret the results and then we do the outreach to the community. So one of those positions that were part of the grant that we received for that COVID-19 screener, we took that position, which is an outreach coordinator, and we, um, we uh, integrated into our request for the budget so we can utilize our general funds, our operational funds to fund a position like that going into next year. So it will be a district outreach coordinator. Um, and so that's one of those things that we are uh, contemplating on doing. I don't know if Ms. Bird wants to add anything to that as it, as it relates to infrastructure. Um, and, and, and she can definitely add to anything that she thinks that we might need for next year as we consider what, um, you know, our budget. This is a, this is a fun moment. Um, <laughs> I, I've spoken with Rod quite a bit about what is, what is ideal, what is necessary. Um, in, in many schools, the infrastructure is set up where we have a small hand, a, a small number of counselors and social workers who are historically designed to provide some basic tier three services, i.e. like individual counseling supports, maybe some groups, 
and maybe some push in tier one supports. Every building's different, every culture's different. Um, and at the high school, you're also responsible for, at the secondary level, I should say, you're, you're responsible for scheduling and you're responsible for a lot of things for all kids. At the high school, it's particularly amplified because of the college process, right? With the past, I'm gonna say 10 years and the increase in ongoing mental health needs, and the increase of anxiety and depression and chronic stress that our students have been reporting on YRBSs for years. And with the chronic stress that our students have been reporting around school, just in general, that need has started to blossom and balloon into, we can't continue to use our counselors in the same way. And that infrastructure is a little broken that we need to begin to teach SEL skills, these basic skills at the universal tier one, every student needs to get those skills as a preventative model because just sending a stressed kid to the counselor is insufficient. Counselors don't have the bandwidth to see every stressed kid. That's just never gonna happen. And now that we have a COVID world where Perhaps you had a pyramid once before where 80% of your kids were doing just fine with what they got. Then maybe 20% needed a group or a little bit more. And then maybe five or 10% needed a counselor or something more. COVID has given us a flipped pyramid. We have an upside down pyramid. And there is no fast fix for that. And we're also not going to see, you know, with the pandemic and with COVID, you see your peak after about two weeks, right? With the medical world. What we're gonna see is a peak in education that's going to hit special ed out of district, private schools. And that's how we're going to see the mental health peak. It's gonna be slower, but it's gonna last longer. And so what we need to think about as schools for infrastructure is how do we quickly build up our tier one promotion when it comes to social emotional learning skills, but also for disabilities, universal design for learning so that we can stem the flow on the mental health referral side and on the special ed referral side, because that's the only show in town when it comes to schools. So we are going to predict, everyone's predicting it, massive influx to both of those tracks, because that's the only way kids get help in schools if they're not getting it in the classroom. So I think that aligns very much with what Allison Elmer has been talking about in terms of tier one, getting supports down as early as often um, and get them in general ed for all kids. It's not a special ed problem. It's a general ed everybody problem. Uh, same thing with mental health and social emotional learning. That's why you'll notice everything we talk about is tier one. And simultaneously, we need an infrastructure to assess catch kids early and have tier two supports. So we need to be able to run small groups. We need to be able to coordinate that. We don't have a full-time director for the counseling department. And when we do, it's only secondary. We don't have something overseeing it at the elementary level. So if that was something, I know that's been discussed. I know that's been talked about. I would definitely support any moves in that direction. It's a lot of work to try to do SEL and counseling. Um, I know the SEL support from Laura has been tremendous. I know that there's a lot of support in the budget moving forward for that. I'm very grateful. Um, and I think continuing that kind of infrastructural support to do the assessments, to get teachers the data and the training is what's going to be critical. So stimulus money to allow us to hire more staff would be good. And I hear it's coming. So um, yes, but to be mindful about the staffing. Yeah, I, I, that, that's that lovely. Yes, that's what came to mind. There needs to be more staff to do this. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so thank you. Good. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Thielman. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Seeing none. Uh, thank you so much, um, Ms. Bird and Ms. Rodriguez, for coming tonight. It was great to have you here. Um, so, and I'm trying to be better at, at blessing and releasing people when they're done so that they don't feel any awkwardness to like stay with us. Um, we're super fun, um, but uh, we really appreciate that you guys came and uh, we hope that you have a really good night. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. And I, um, 
I did put the link to the SEL website in the slides. So um, if folks are looking for that, you can find it there. Thank you. So Dr. McNeil, I don't believe those slides are in Nanovis. So no. could you uh, email them either to Ms. Fitzgerald tomorrow or alternately um, append that, like put them into Novis uh, retroactively and then just shoot us an email and let us know, that would be great. Yes, I will, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the FY22. I'm having a really hard time with 2022. It looks really weird, 2022. Okay, FY2022 overview of the Arlington Public Schools budget. Uh, Mr. Mason. All right, sorry, I had to find the, the mute button. Can everybody see the presentation? Yep. All right, uh, I actually will have, uh, uh, we have a presentation for you this evening to discuss the FY22 proposed budget. Um, and Dr. McNeil will start it off. Normally, uh, Kathy, uh, Dr. Bodie uh, would start and introduce the budget. Um, and uh, I will hand it over to Dr. McNeil. Can you, yes. Uh, so thank you for that, um, Mr. Mason. And so when we introduced the, the budget, I just wanna um, give the assertion that, you know, as we thought about the things that we would need for next year, it kind of came up in a question previously when we were talking about our, our presentation at the end of our, uh, previous presentations like what was our thought process you know of course we're thinking about you know what is it going to take to bring students back what are we going to have to do to provide uh, for the, some of the remedial needs but we also want to always go back to our mission statement which is drives everything that we do within Arlington and so the, our you know Arlington Public Schools mission statement the mission of the school system of the Arlington Public Schools is to educate students by promoting academic excellence by empowering students to achieve their maximum potential and by, and by preparing students for responsible participation in an ever-changing world. The Arlington Public Schools are committed to helping every student achieve emotional, social, vocational, and academic success. So we know that these are the things that we are the cornerstone of what we do. And so when we make our decisions and when we set our goals, we always uh, link it back to our, you know, what we value, which is um, articulated in our mission statement. Let me go to the next slide. So, you know, I won't go through and read this, but as we think about, you know, the characteristics and the what students should be able to do once they matriculate through Arlington Public Schools is listed in our vision of student as learner and global citizen. And then, you know, <laughs> In order to make sure that happens, we have to keep this at the forefront of our minds as we design instruction and giving opportunities to students to practice this. And so that's part of like, you know, kind of part of the presentation that we were, we gave before. So we're looking at this through the, the, the MTSS lens, uh, looking at tier one instruction. What do we want students to be able to do when they graduate? And not only when they graduate, but as they matriculate through every grade. So this this vision of student as learner and global citizen, you know, has a uh, is aspirational, and hopefully by the time students are graduate, they're able to, you know, um, they are able to uh, represent the, the, these skills and and do the things that is listed in the statement. And then one more. We also have our. Um, can you advance the slide? Oh, so. You know, I also want to talk about the transferable skills. We do have a document that highlights the transferable skills that we know that students need to have in order to do the things that um, are listed in the vision of student as learner and global citizen. So I just wanted to add that and, um, you know, as a, as a final point. So I'm going to now hand it back over to Mr. Mason and he can talk about the budget and the things that we've identified uh, with this, all these you know, this mission, which, you know, articulates our values and the things that we want students to be able to do, that hasn't changed um, because of the pandemic. We're still focused on that, but we know that we might have to add 
uh, some support for students in order to get them react, you know, acclimated back into school, schools, and then we can continue to think about our what the instructional process will look like. But this is our this is our cornerstone of what we want students to be able to do. So back to you, Mr. Mason. Thank you, thank you, Dr. McNeil. Um, and once again, good evening. And and uh, tonight, uh, I I did change the document that was originally submitted to some adjustments and to, to, to additional information. This budget obviously is a blueprint. It's going to change, it's going to adjust. That's the reason why it wasn't provided to you as a full budget book yet. And I'll have more information in terms of when you will get that full budget book towards the end. Um, the, the number that may not be final that we get, but it's the most recent and it's the most likely budget figure uh, that we will get to use for this year's budget. And but the heart of the decision, as Rod had just mentioned, is our mission um, and all of these the statements made on those slides. And in, in addition to exactly what Sarah and Rod were, and, and Laura were talking about in terms of the tiers of support. Uh, and I want to emphasize this to everyone that the current budget is just a blueprint, as all budgets are. But however, this is what we as the district administration see and from what we currently understand are our needs right now. Um, the, current, the fiscal 22 budget focuses on addressing additional teaching positions at all levels. So over the past eight years, we've seen substantial enrollment growth. Um, that enrollment from, I believe 2012 to 2019 was nearly 1400, it was about 13, 1,399 students were um, in terms of enrollment growth that Arlington seen. And so this year was the first year that we actually did see a decrease of enrollment um, or a net reduction of enrollment of 200 by 287 students. And I've provided the school committee and other uh, town committees with this information previously in, in, in the analysis that we have done. Um, we also sent out a survey to parents of the students that were either transferred, moved out of the town or homeschooled back in December that showed that at that point in time, at least half of those students um, will likely return if we were open back in person for full-time learning in a similar model that we had prior to the pandemic. Um, this did not include any additional students that we were expecting from the previous enrollment trend. So the next slide, I will discuss more about that. Also our budget, we try, to, we try to focus on as additional resources for special education students or in students with special needs, um, along with resources allocated for remedial services in order to support students that have higher needs or de demands due to the change of instruction model um, that was a result of the pandemic. And you will also see that there will be an increase of administrative support that we've discussed in previous budget discussions from our administrators back in December. Um, and so with enrollment growth uh, and growing demands from the past uh, for the student to support students and both teachers because of the growing teacher staff, additional administrative support is definitely something that we see as necessary. Um, we also see that there's a need to continue our progress and in increasing resources. Uh, we've dedicated to social emotional learning um, so you'll see that in this presentation, you'll see that in the memo that I sent out to you uh, that is on the list of ads, as well as additional investments for reading and math uh, to ensure equity, um, inclusion and access for all our students to, to close the achievement gap. So this slide um, is a projection of what the original projection was. So we were seeing, based on a, an agreed formula that we use for our enrollment projection to use in our, our funding model. And the original projection had projected us um, still increasing over the next, sorry, hit the wrong button, over the next few years and eventually tapering off. But during that, during that time frame, when we had the, we've actually showed that the lower line here, the red line, shows that using that same formula and uh, due to that the deep decrease of, of students this year, which show a trending down line. 
Now we all know that that's not what's actually going to happen. And there's a more likely projection that I provide I provided in previous meetings that will more likely happen with the return of the students that I just discussed and um, and using the certain the, the pre previous trend that we were seeing. Um, and that would show that this this yellow line, which we will still eventually catch up to the previous enrollment projection. And that would show that we would have a substantial growth if we indeed commit and, and people feel secure returning back to school uh, for a school year 2021-2022. So in order to establish a budget, we, I, you know, we have to review all the revenue sources, uh, understand the enrollment to establish a budget target. And um, you know, the funds included in building our budget is built from the town appropriation, which include chapter 70 state aid, town local contribution, um, grants and revolving and, and circuit breaker. And so this chart explains how the districts has been funded over the last few years and seeing those trends. And you'll see that this particular year our obviously state aid did not increase that much um, due to Delsey, Department of Elementary and Second Educa Education and the state and the governor's current budget using the enrollment that we had in October 1. And meaning that we didn't have any growth so they would not be see any uh, additional monies per se, but would be held harmless uh, to uh, what from that enrollment decrease. Um, the town does provide a set percentage increase in our formula for special ed and general ed. Um, and so they also in the current figure uh, stay to the commitment of providing 800,000. Uh, that was part of the operating override and they, and on top of that, are see, uh, seeking to add $230,000 that would be part of the, the repayment of what they did not pay us for the commitment for last year um, where we reduced our, 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 our budget in agreement with them of by $460,000. If you remember last year, we were supposed to receive $600,000 added to our base. So the numbers break down for FY22 like this. For our total FY22 town appropriation, that includes the state aid and the, um, the local contribution, um, which is a step, substantial portion of the taxpayer's dollars is $80,104,634. Uh, the town appropriation uh, includes funding from both uh, uh, that, that, that state aid formula that I discussed and um, is about $4.45 million higher or exactly about 6% increase from the prior year. However, uh, normally we would project grants at a higher amount and you'll see that the grants are reflecting actually a negative amount. And that is because typically we keep core grants that we normally get year to year in here but I thought it was important to show that this year we did receive additional money from the uh, coronavirus stimulus funds. Um, so that included ASR1 funds, which was about 150,000 and about another $1.3 million from the CVRF funds, which was coronavirus relief funds to reopen schools this year. We're not gonna receive those funds Currently, we, we are slotted to receive ESSER two when we apply for it, which is a little bit over $500,000. That was what I added to your to the memo when I sent the a new memo back up. Um, there is talks about uh, a current other another allocation, which would be about nine times the higher than the, the levels of ESSER one. Um, but that's still to be negotiated. Those numbers can also drop down. Um, there was also a reduction in uh, circuit breaker on top of the reduction that we've seen last year. And that is due to the reduction in our out of district spending. Um, circuit breaker is a reimbursement of that um, spending when we hit a certain threshold. And so that gives us our final actual change in funding, um, which is about $3 million 
uh, when including grants and revolving in the spending. Uh, revolving negative doesn't reflect that we received less money. We do have some, some reserve balances, but as well as we did not receive much revenue this year in FY21. So some of our revolvings did take a hit this year. Um, and so we will need to definitely look at those balances, but we do feel com comfortable that we will still spend from our revolving and do expect that our revenues will increase or pick back up on those revolving funds. This chart uh, uh, shown is, is uh, in, we, normally shown in the past, it shows the total budget for the district, uh, but it shows it, it as a pie chart showing that the local contribution contribution is about 75% of the funding and, uh, for Arlington. Uh, so the grants is a really smaller portion of that and uh, chapter 70 is about 17%. Um, so it's about $14.7 million. This slide shows how we're gonna spend the budget. Typically the, you, the school committee votes on budget transfers categories and the amounts that we will spend per category. Um, and the largest part of our budget still remains to be special education, um, followed then by secondary and elementary. And that's what's shown here. Um, so this year, typically, since it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a different type of year, we're still trying to build the budget, budget a little bit more, but I wanted to keep it very simple. We got on the town appropriation side, and this only reflects that, we've received 4.5 million extra dollars that there, that it's on the table possibly. And um, we anticipate that with some adjustments and salary increases, increases, we will have to, in contractual obligations, um, we will have to spend out about $2.25 million to cover that, um, those things that we anticipate. And then that really leaves us about $2.2 .2 million to do some additional ads to meet the needs that we need for this year. And to also cover any positions that we added from last year uh, or from the current fiscal year, should I say, not last year. So I wanted to go into the ads and talk about what the ads are. I gave you the list, um, but just to kind of briefly give you a, a understanding of each of the ads. I'm not, I may not touch on all the ads, um, but one of the things that we, we're going to add is a 0.2 uh, preschool teacher, which is to provide ELL instructional support services to the preschool, as well as testing for compliance and state uh, regulations, and to also begin English language development in the preschool. Um, also looking at uh, adding a special education teacher for the SLC that's the, they were planning to move the part of the SLCC program to the Hardy. Um, and so we will need at least a, a special ed teacher and two uh, teaching uh, assistants for that program shift for the next year, as well as um, some additional support for the SL, um, so special education as a team chair and the SLP uh, for the SLCA and SLC to increase the, the staffing level. One thing is uh, we talked about um, in the previous, I was heard in the previous meetings, it was about the assistant principals. Uh, uh, so there's been a need due to the enrollment growth that we've seen in the past, that there's been a growth in staff. And that means that principals have taken on a lot, a lot larger uh, responsibilities in terms of the amount of people that they're managing, the evaluations that they have to do, uh, more meetings that they have to support, uh, the more students that they have to support in general. And so that means there's less opportunities for principals to be instructional leaders in their schools. So the assistant and principals, we strongly believe we would support, but this does not not necessarily support giving all uh, schools assistant principals. This will just support to get schools based on that need the, the, the full assistant principals, the level of support that they need. Um, in addition, we, you know, we have a reading teacher, obviously, as I discussed before about 
the, the reading and math support, you'll see that on here, um, as well as addressing some maybe some the, 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 the lead math coach, which is a position to provide support to overseeing uh, the large staff that the, the math department has, um, which would provide a more consistent oversight of the program um, that are really specific for elementary, as well as you know setting up additional meeting time with the elementary principals. Um, it, you know, the current structure, it makes it difficult for, you know, uh, the current staff to do that, as well as the literacy coaches to provide additional support to close the achievement gap. The, the Gibbs ads um, also continue the certain trends. We do need the math support um, or some level of, uh, of resources that should be added to provide that, as well as, um, an SLP for the Gibbs. One thing the the I, I believe the the new principal at the Gibbs also mentioned was the need for additional administrative support in, in the main office. Uh, that would also give it up to equity with the Audison Middle School. Uh, we did we couldn't provide the full request ad. Uh, we did provide at least half of that in this budget. That. We believe that the Gibbs is not as big as the Audison, but it does need the support and a half would be the compromise to do that. Um, and occupational uh, therapist increases just to, to address the enrollment growth in, the, that, in that load for that per particular staff. So the proposed additions also at the, the other middle school, the Audison Middle School, which is also support for reading as, as there's a, a, a core of students that are entering into the audits in middle school. There's expected over about 80 students that are gonna be coming from the Gibbs this year. Uh, in, I mean, that year from the Gibbs will need um, additional reading support. They're already in the reading in, this, in the program, getting that additional support. And currently at the Gibbs is three reading teachers. So adding a teacher at the Audison would actually bring Audison up to three as well. And Audison as a larger school should also have more reading support. Um, also adding a social worker uh, at the Audison Middle School. So currently the Audison has two social workers and the two social workers as I believe Sarah kind of pointed out is a lot of the, the counseling and, and this work is done for students that are more that have the IEPs or special needs. Um, they, they're not necessarily supporting the general education students. So this social worker ad would be there to support um, students who do not have IEPs and, um, and also uh, support the bridge program at the Audison Middle School, if, I'm, if, I, if I remember correctly. Um, let me see, and there's also some allocations just for enrollment growth for the Spanish teacher and the music teacher and just additional math support also at the Audison Middle School. The high school, um, generally it's, it was driven by trying to catch up the, the high school based on the enrollment. When we, when we open up in full person, there's, we need to be able to provide students with the classes that they need to, for the students or that they want for the electives. And so we do have provided just a general 2.3 FTE uh, for classroom teachers um, for the high school teacher at the high school, as well as four additional student support staff that were really mainly for, um, for special education. And in addition to that, uh, this is not necessarily specific for the high school, it's for the secondary level, is providing some SLS, SEL support specifically for the secondary level, um, which is uh, being put in place to continue to support the efforts that we've been, that if, if you remember, we did the same thing last year, we added some, some funds for, SLS, for our SEL support last year, that's uh, in our current budget. And uh, you know, the idea that, you know, that was brought up earlier about the need for, you know, um, that Sarah was, you know, said in her, her comments about the needs of, the, of counseling and, S and social emotional learning, um, basically was the idea that there might be the need of bifurcating counseling and, and social emotional learning. And so we're still in discussions. This is something that we're still trying to work out. And I think that, uh, you know, this is obviously, uh, it's a clear placeholder as well as the possibility that it might have to adjust after we evaluate further the needs of, of the two departments. 
Um, District-wide proposals, typically we always have reserved positions in the budget to address the uncertainty of enrollment growth or any uncertain changes that we need to make. In addition, we are also setting aside reserve position, special ed teacher positions, or not necessarily teaching positions. It's, 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 it's meant to be there to, to support the idea that there is a possible possibility that we have to address different workload issues or areas of concern. So that, that is what the, the special ed uh, reserve teaching positions are there are for. And um, we also, um, like many other districts, and the town has already have their own equity and inclusion uh, role. Uh, the school department is also looking to add an equity and inclusion and access coordinator um, because of the need. The, you know, um, we we can't just we we currently used our the town resources, but that that's not enough for what we need in the school district. Uh, we need more resources to address the equity and inclusion um, and access. Uh, issues and uh, the role is to also to provide support um, in in those areas. But um, in addition, uh, you know, what we, we, we were talking and thinking about this is that a lot of districts are already doing this. Uh, several districts have either already hired this year or are going to do in the near future. And so um, there, there's definitely a, seems to be a need to make sure that uh, we can address some of these issues by adding this position. And um, in addition to that, adding a district data manager or analyst, uh, uh, testing coordinator, um, a position that is a need to, to help us provide targeted support to close the achievement gap. Um, we need to, uh, a person dedicated to collecting and reviewing the various data points to, to inform creation of goals or pinpoint strategies to, to address uh, achievement gap issues. And, uh, uh, the po position will obviously work in tandem with the equ equity, inclusion, and access coordinator, as well as the su assistant superintendent. So after I talk your ear off all this time and put you to sleep, um, I'm. what's next, I would hope to have a, a full budget book to you by February 25th that we normally would have already provided to you. We have a good substantial portion of it already completed. It might look different this year again, but in a good way, hopefully, uh, so that you guys will take to it well. It, it, it may be electronic um, using the ClearGov website. So we're working with them. There, after that, there will be also a public hearing for the FY22 budget on March 11th. And um, if all is well, the school committee will vote on that budget on the 25th. And then we will present to FINCOM and um, Go to town meeting out shortly out thereafter. I'll I'll leave it to, to you, Jane, uh, to facilitate the questions. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Mason. Um I think we're, I, I my questions I know are gonna relate to the slides, but um maybe just so that I can see everybody, if we can go back to the like the Brady Bunch screen for a minute. Um, and and then we can go to your slides as needed. So um, uh, I, I'm actually I'm going to start with with my question. So I'm actually I'm going to make you go back, Mr. Mason, to the slide with the enrollment, the yellow, blue, and red, if you would. So I think my computer is active. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well take take your time. I can I can pontificate as you're doing that, and then we can all look at it and then be done with it. Um, so what, I think, yeah, it, it was well. It was very close to. The, it was where you were showing um, the enrollment with a start date of FY22, I believe. So there was a yellow line and a red line and a blue line, I believe. Lovely. Um, so I think the important piece here was that, you know, if you look at um, FY uh, 20, if you, if you look at FY 2021, right, which is the year that we've finished and, and, you know, all of these, you know, there were a lot of students that didn't come in September. Um, and the, the long range plan had over a million dollars in uh, enrollment increases that that we're not realizing in FY22 um, appropriately because those students didn't show up. Um, but you know, 
it's, it's a lot of money that we left on the table. And while some of those students moved out of state and moved out of Arlington and some of them moved to homeschooling, um, a lot of them went in search of, of full-time in-person learning, right? And Mr. Mason did a lot of analysis for us in the budget subcommittee and we went through that. Um, and so I think this really speaks to the conversation we had earlier about looking ahead to the spring um, and when we may be in a position or we will be hopefully in a position to bring students back full time. Um, I think this is critically important because I think that a lot of families are making decisions about what they're going to do in September based on how this district behaves between now and the end of June. And um, if we're unable to bring students back or some students back full time, then that is not going to is not going to encourage them to either re enroll or enroll or stay enrolled right um, here come September and and we could be in a situation where you know if if we don't do that we're we could potentially not be Mr. Mason's yellow likely projection which I I support um, I support that projection if we if we bring students back to full in-person learning I we are not going to see that happen if we don't bring them back um, and so I you know I think that the the conversations we're having about what school looks like this spring have a lot to do you know they obviously have to do with health and safety certainly and they have to do with with teaching and learning, but they also have a lot to do with what the budget looks like. And, you know, our budget for this year was projected to be a million dollars higher. And um, it, you know, that's not happening because we didn't bring them back in September. So um, I think that it's, it's really important to, to realize that and for that to be a piece of the conversation. And otherwise, um, I think that this was a great presentation, Mr. Mason, it was very comprehensive. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Um, we've, we've gone over this um, at length in budget subcommittee, so I don't have any questions. So um, if we could go back, Mr. Mason, to the grid view, lovely. All right, um, other questions or comments uh, for uh, Dr. McNeil and Mr. Mason around the budget presentation? Uh, Mr. Cardin? Thank you. Um, so uh, Ms. Elmer isn't with us tonight, but I don't know if, if you can speak, Mr. Mason, if you can speak to the proposal to move the SLC program to Hardy um, and how that's the planning for that is occurring, how that's going to happen, have the families been consulted. Um, I believe they collapsed it to one classroom at their next year. So is it that you're just adding the younger classroom to Hardy and only a few kids are moving or are both classes moving? What's the plan? I, I, I do not have the full details of that plan. I will I will call to Dr. McNeil if he has any information in regards to that. No, I don't need either. And I, I we need to consult Ms. Elmer for the details of the plan. I don't think they've been flushed out. I mean, I, 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 let me back up and not say that. We need to consult Ms. Elmer for the details of the plan in order to understand where we are in the planning phase. That's what I meant to say. Okay, thanks. I mean, I think, you know, uh, this has been mentioned for, for many years uh, on and off because we, we did add classrooms to Hardy, which are not being used, whereas Bracket does not have any empty classrooms. Uh, so from a school system's perspective, it makes sense. Um, but we're, if we're potentially, depending on how it's structured, requiring people to switch schools, um, which is a significant ask for people. Um, so you know, when those kids were enrolled in the program, a lot of them had to switch schools once. And so if we are affecting kids, we're requiring them to switch schools again. Um, so I, I just wanna make sure that we're being very careful and minimizing the impact to the extent we can. Thank you. That's a very good point. And we will uh, make sure that we come back with uh, an, updated, um, an updated response to your question. Great, thanks. Other questions on the budget, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, I just wanted to get, I just want to make sure I have in my head the numbers straight. So the, the, the net FTE increase is, is I'm looking at, I'm, I'm not my screen here, but 
memo that was sent in advance. Thirty-six point three FTEs. Is that my <clears throat> correct? Yeah, thirty-six point three FTEs, totaling four point five three four million dollars. Okay. Well, um, the four point five million dollars includes the, the, the yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm 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 sorry. Um. <clears throat> okay. And can you? So in the assistant principal discussion, which we've had a lot of back and forth on, the the final solution, the final recommendation from the district is to add one assistant. I'm trying to get a clar clarification. How many assistant principals are you proposing? So it would be uh, a total of 6.5 assistant principals. Okay. In terms of FTE of uh, full-time equivalents. Okay, all right, thank you. Mr. Hainer. Uh, on the uh, added staff for the high school, uh, Mr. Mason, the four FTA, FTEs uh, for support, are they AIDS? Correct. Okay. There's, and there's special ed. Thank you. And the 2.3 classroom, are they uh, already been assigned uh, if it gets passed to specific classes? Subjects? They have not been assigned yet. That's doc, Dr. Jango will have to look at his needs and what what um, his enrollment uh, will dictate in terms okay. of- You class. made a distinction between that and uh, on the next slide, you had FTEs, FTEs for anticipated enrollment growth. Is that what the 2.3 at the high school is too? So the 2.3 is, actually really a catch up for enrollment. So in the five-year plan, um, there was mo a modeling of adding five or so teachers per year based on enrollment. We didn't meet that the last two years based on that enrollment growth. And so we, we've actually shorted the high school in terms of the positions that they, they, were, they were projecting that they needed. And so this is to actually get them to where they should be in okay. terms of the request. Thank you. Last question, the equity inclusion uh, position, has that got a job description yet? No, we do not have a job description. Uh, we've been speaking about it um, and we're doing a lot, some research on the actual position and all of our needs to fit that I understand. You, you need to get funded too before you go full board. Thank you. Exactly. Uh, Ms. Exton. Thanks. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand. So the K to five lead literacy coach, is that the same um, as the reading K to five reading coordinator that the principals presented back in December? It's just sort of been renamed. I can take that. Um, so not necessarily um, because the, the, the coaching is still an instructional coach. So that person will be providing, as we talked about the multi-tiered systems of support, like looking at tier one instruction and strengthening that tier one instruction. But yes, that, that lead coach will be like a go-to um, for the elementary level to talk about the management of materials, making sure that um, you know teachers have what they need, but still providing that instructional coaching to uh, teachers. And so we, that was also something as we were looking at, at the five-year plan, you know, as it related to literacy, our projection or our goal was to provide a literacy coach for all our elementary schools. And again, that's, you know, strengthening that tier one in, uh, instructional support. And that is one way that we're doing it by looking at the instructional coach and also managing the things that we need to do uh, in order to provide the materials and resources and having a focus on early literacy. So that's, that's you know, one reason why we have that person in place, but it's going to shift over time as we are able to have, you know, more coaching coaches at each one of the buildings, then, um, you know, that, that may evolve over time uh, as so, may, may not be the lead coach, you know. Okay, so it's adding an additional coach literacy coach who has sort of 
an additional role of coordinating materials. Right. And we're also going to the person that we, we would seek to hire in that position would have a specialty like a, a focus on early literacy. So we're trying to strengthen that part of our coaching um, regime. And so that our regiment, excuse me, and so to make sure that we have the um, that that we have the proper focus in that area. And then, yes, managing the materials, making sure that we're we have what we need in order to build that uh, that strong early literacy program. And is that so then is this the idea the same for the lead math coach? Lead math coach, same thing, uh, trying to find like a go-to person for principals, again, not taking away that uh, ability to provide the instructional coaching uh, for our teachers. So, um, and then that person would confer with uh, Matt Coleman, the director of uh, math, K-12 math. So trying to provide more um, a foundation and more support at the elementary level. Okay. And then, sorry, one more. And then the sure. social studies coach, is that adding a second social studies coach for K to five? Yes, you know, with all the things that have been going on in society and, and our focus on trying to, you know, you know uh, provide a multicultural perspective. Um, and, and as we're building the social studies curriculum at the elementary level, we haven't found like, you know, a, one of those, you know, I, I'll call it a canned um, program or resource that has everything that we need. Uh, because when we look at the standards, we want to make sure that we're supplementing with the multicultural materials. So what we're doing is we're curating the various resources and the uh, social studies department uh, you know, and Denny Conklin, our director, we've decided that we're going to create something that's um, to customize something for our needs in Arlington. And uh, so we are putting together resources and creating our own curriculum and developing our lessons so we can have that multicultural perspective and you know, providing more learning experiences where students can see themselves in the materials. And so in order to do that, we have to you know, really look for resources that are, um, and then construct our own curriculum. So that takes a quite an effort. Uh, and so that we need that extra social studies coach in order to help with those efforts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hainer. Sorry, quick question. These coaches, are they part of the unit A? Yes. Yes. So they wouldn't have any uh, evaluative uh, no. responsibilities or communication with uh, principals and things of that nature regarding evaluations, am I correct? No, they, they would be, uh, again, instructional coaches, you know, working on improving uh, things that, you know, areas that uh, teachers want to work on and setting goals, that, that sort of thing. No, not, they would not be part of the evalu evaluation process. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mason. And I don't know if your presentation is already in Novus. Um, but if not, if we could get it in there, that'd be great. Um, I guess one question, well, not a question, but a point is, I wish we had something that showed us as we do these ads, have an idea of what the base is um, because it's just hard for me to get a good picture of how much effect we're given, how much effect we're getting with these things, not knowing. I mean, I, I know some of this stuff, but it's just, it's hard for me to keep it all in my head and compare all at the same time. Um, so that's one kind of wish list thing for the actual budget book. Uh, and then another question is, I felt like one of the things that we've heard as a concern during the pandemic is that math especially has been not moving forward as much as we would like. And I feel like I'm not seeing this as reflected in the positions here. And I'm just, and, and especially knowing what I remember from the base is that we're not as strong in math in terms of manpower as we are in literacy. So I'm just confused. Could you repeat that last part again? 
my recollection is that we don't have as many bodies, um, math coaches and stuff as we do literacy. I mean, it, it's gotten better, but we're not, we don't have as many. And I thought that I had heard that math especially has been an area where we're kind of behind because of the pandemic. And looking at the positions being added, I don't see those two facts reflected in the ads. So what, what, I guess I'm, what would you like? I would, I would think we would need more math support. I mean, more math support in terms of people. And I'm not seeing it here as much. Are you talking about math interventionists? Like, because that, like, I, I and, and I, I want to be between the two roles. I'm just asking okay. so I can, I can understand yeah. exactly what you're asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we have the, so we have the what, coaches that support instruction, and then we have math interventionists that provide direct intervention to students. So I just want to make sure that I'm understanding what you're asking. And I'm saying it could be either of those things. Okay. I'm seeing, I don't, I feel like there's not as much energy put into math I mean, in terms we don't have as much push in math in terms of people given what we've been hearing about the issues in math all right but it depends on what you're talking about because we have more math coaches than we do literacy coaches right now. We have four literacy coaches in the district. So we have more math coaches. And I don't, and I think maybe you're referring to, I don't, I, and I wanna make sure I'm understanding you. You're talking about more, more direct services to students, right? It's the whole thing. <laughs> okay, the whole thing. It's so not just, it's, it's not just, what we're trying to do is enhance math instruction next year to try and catch up mm -hmm. right yeah because we're behind and so it's both interventionists and coaches it's what we're we're trying to do that i didn't realize that we didn't have as many literacy coaches now as we do math coaches so that's where having a picture of what we have would be helpful Okay, uh, perfect. I can I can definitely get that for you. So like what you want is like an organizational chart of yes. what the math department looks like and what the organizational chart looks like with the, the literacy department as it relates to um, elementary um, literacy and elementary math. Or do you want it for like yeah. the whole district or is that a, a specific the level? The whole, no, okay. the, whole, the whole thing. As much okay. org chart as possible, that would be great. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. I just, I, I just wanted to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm, I'm sorry for the questions, but I just wanted to make sure that I was responding and, and understanding what you were asking for. If I, if I could add. Go ahead, Mr. Mason. Um, so I appreciate the, also the, the, the comment. We, we do have 3.2 FTEs in the, in the budget that's geared towards some level of math support. And then we do have various reserve positions, not necessarily that it's going to address directly uh, a standard classroom. Uh, you know, spaces do eventually become limited in that sense too. Um, but that those reserve positions can also be used for the math math support that we need. But I think it's good that you bring up that point. The other uh, other um, the point I want to make to address the the position, uh, or getting the base idea of the positions. Um, I, in hindsight, you know, after you mentioned that that you made that statement, I said, "Wow, it'd have been great to kind of provide some kind of baseline FTE count in the presentation." So, I will do. I will look at providing that something like that in the future. Typically, in the budget book, we do provide a position schedule. Um, I can look at how to to to, to have it arranged based on department um, or program, so that you can see exactly what you need and. The difference this year when I'm, I was planning on how I was going to present that was that I was going to show what, what was I had originally in the base 21 budget, what was the actual in 21, because 21 was a very unique year and we did a lot of ads. Um, and so part of my, I had to do a lot of analysis of looking at 
where we did ads compared to what I thought we were going to, to have, and then showing the additional positions that we're adding this year. So you'll see that the schedule will be slightly different to reflect that. And I think that will give you a better understanding of the base positions. Seeing that, okay, this is what we thought was in the base of FY21. This is what actually happened this year in all the adjustments. And then this is what we're currently rolling over and adding. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Great. All right. Thank you, Dr. McNeil and Mr. Mason. Great job. Um, looking forward to continuing along our budget calendar as presented by Dr. Allison Ampey and the budget subcommittee. We forge ahead uh, and are now on a new row. So that's great. Keeping on, keeping on track, which is great. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda is a vote to approval of the town appropriation number, the town appropriation in the amount of $80,104,634. So moved. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, uh, let's vote. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Alice Nampy? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Um, next item is the Chief Information Officer recruitment process. Um, so it sounds like um, Dr. Uh, David Good is retiring. Um, so Mr. Mason, I was wondering if you could give us an update on um, where we're at with that process and how it affects the schools briefly. Yeah, yeah no, no, no worries. Um, first, I'd like to say I, I, I really, it was a pleasure to work with David. Um, we had a, a, a link before me coming here to work in Arlington of a person in common uh, and uh, he's been really, he's always been supportive and responsive. So he's going to have big shoes to fill, um, you know. Uh, so in the memo, it, it kind of briefly states the process in which how we're going to select the chief information officer. And um, so far has been very a very collaborative process up to this point, um, which is very important since David and the, the whole IT team has, has provided substantial support to the school department. And uh, especially even this year when we needed all the devices for having the students uh, that are remote and new, the teacher refresh devices, it took a lot of work. So um, the, currently the position is already posted. Um, the first start after that process, the town HR and a select group will review the resumes and do that initial screening process. And then we'll be represented in the process where the school department um, a representative, which will be me, will be uh, part of the second round of interviews. And then the final step will then be, we'll send a finalist or finalists to uh, a selection interview with uh, the, the town manager and the, the, the superintendent. And so the goal is to have the selection completed by late April. Um, and Obviously, we would like to treat our selected finalists with the same courtesy we expect from them. So if all goes well, best case is we could have a selected finalist start in the role as early as May um, or early in May. And um, it may be later if uh, the individual may have certain project that they're currently working at on in their current employment obligations. Um, and currently, we, we do have uh, Dan Sheehan. He's in the interim. And so uh, I think that... Uh, you know, I think that basically sums it up. I, the implications to the school department is that we'll have a new CIO at the end of this process, and uh, hopefully they can, you know, meet to, and 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 be a substantial part of the team as David was. And I'd just like to say that it was a pleasure to work with uh, David as well, coming in as the assistant superintendent and looking at how we could merge instructional technology with the tech uh, technology department. 
Uh, we, in, we have, we, you know, with him, we created an integrated uh, technology team. And so that's why I think that, you know, through his management and leadership, we were able to do that. And then like the, just the distribution of, you know, over 900 devices over the past year, even more than that. Um, and keeping track of the inventory and making sure that it got in the hands of students all uh, because of David and the way that his team responded. So I just want to definitely highlight him while we're, you know, giving him accolades at this point and, and say that he definitely served the district and the town very well. And it was a pleasure to work with him. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments for Mr. Mason? Mr. Thielman, followed by Mr. Schuchman. Um, I just want to echo, I've known Dave Good for a long time now, uh, and he was an outstanding partner of the school district, and I just want to use this opportunity to thank him for all he's done for us. Mr. Schuchman? I concur. David was very good, and now that he's gone, there's no good. But I I'd like to get a copy of the job description. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mason, could you provide that to us through Karen? Yes, I could. Also, I meant to say that there was slight adjustments. I did miss that in my notes, that there was slight adjustments to the job description. So you'll see that because David did, um, in his position, it grew over time. He, get, he gained a lot more responsibilities. So we had to adjust that with the, with the town. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Cardin and then Dr. Allison Ampey. Uh, thank you. So I, I, I saw this on the select board agenda. So I just wanted to make sure that we were uh, aware of it as well, because it's an important position for the district. Um, but I also noted that they hired a new facilities director, which I did not know they were going forward with. So um, uh, it would be good for us to those two those position two positions are shared. So they're a little bit unusual. The superintendent is you know sharing in the decision making and in the process. But it would be useful to be notified. Um, as with any department head position that's being filled. Thanks. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I guess I'm wondering where will this position live? Will it still be completely shared or will it, is it going one way or the other? Mr. Mason or yeah, Mr. Mason, do you have any? Yeah, so, no, it, it's still going to be shared. There's no change in the arrangement that we have between uh, this department or the staffing model. So if you if if the current staffing model is that there is a, a chief information officer, um, and then there are two assistant directors, one specifically that supports the schools and one's more for the town side. And so uh, Dan Sheehan has been served at, serving as the assistant director on the school side. Um, and we've worked closely with him over the time and as well, he's currently sitting as the interim currently. Okay. I guess one thing when I looked at the um, recruitment and hiring process, I felt like there was a lot of representation more from the town than from the schools. And I don't, I don't know if that's a problem or not because I don't know how far apart our interests or not so much interests, but our needs are, you know, the things that we call upon the information technology officer to do versus what the town calls on. And I'm just concerned that it seemed like the first screening doesn't have any representation by the schools. And then the second one has two thirds town, one third schools, and then you know, then we're down, but you've already weeded out a bunch of people. And I just don't know, I'm trying to make sure that our needs are well represented in the applicant, are well represented in terms of picking candidates to bring forward. And uh, I was a little concerned about how this was set up that I wasn't sure that that was true. So. If can I share? So um, I appreciate that, those statements. Um, it's interesting, the, the process is very similar to how we selected the facilities director. And I felt that the school, school department did get 
to be, uh, get our voices heard in that selection. In terms of the initial screening out process, it's, a, it's really, um, well, who they bring in an interview, we're not necessarily at the table, but that initial screening process is really streamlined to the point where nobody seeing the names is really a impartial process that I, I believe that I have confidence in that we will find good candidates. And if we do not find the right candidate as we were going through the, the facilities director process, by the time it came to where I was part of that, you know, we, were, we weren't just gonna fill the role, we're gonna find the right person. So if we didn't find somebody, the right person that, that second round, we would obviously go back out and look for more. So, um, I feel pretty confident, but I will take that note and uh, discuss with Kathy and figure out if we want to be part of that process earlier on. Uh, and, and I wanna apologize about uh, Mr. Walters not being, uh, uh, not informing you guys about uh, Greg Walters, who's our facilities director. He just recently started. And um, it, it, that was a, it was, it was a great process though, in terms of finding, we had two great finalists in that process. And so I hope that we have the same turnout in this process. Thank you. Great, anybody else? Okay, seeing none, I, I'm watching the time. So here we go. Consent agenda, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine, will be enacted by one motion, will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be discussed in its normal sequence, vote approval of warrant, warrant number 21167 dated 22-2021 in the amount of 644841.18. Vote approval of minutes, regular meeting minutes, January 28th, 2021. So move. Second. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Curran? Yes. Nampi? Yes. Mr. Newman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. I am also yes. Subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Nampi? We'll be meeting the next, the week after next. Community relations, Mr. Hainer? Uh, we've already had five uh, school committee chats. We'll have our next one uh, this Saturday at 11 o'clock for grades pre-K through fifth, and the following Saturday at 11 o'clock uh, for Metco families. CIAA, Mr. Cardin. Uh, we already discussed earlier, we have a tentative meeting scheduled for uh, the 24th at three o'clock, um, pending confirmation with the administrative team. Uh, and uh, we also still need to meet again with the Human Rights Commission representatives. Uh, so we'll schedule that for early March. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policy, Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. At the last meeting, which was uh, on Tuesday, um, uh, Mr. Hayner moved, seconded by Dr. Allison Ampey, that uh, we ask the chair to invite representatives of the Arlington Human Rights Commission to make a presentation describing progress towards establishing a town policy, adopting a land acknowledgement statement. Great. Oh, come on now, I've lost my sheet. This. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We meet on March 2nd. The building is going up, it's going well. Drive by it and take a look. Uh, liaison reports, announcements, future agenda items. Uh, I have for uh, February uh, 26th, I um, am going to, just so that you know, I'm gonna ask for um, uh, something from Ms. Elmer about the SLC, SLCC move to Hardy, um, the, and then if we can get the land acknowledgement presentation from the Human Rights Commission on there, uh, then great. And if not, we'll have to move it to February. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. I'd just like to ask that we put on the agenda the possibility of uh, making a temporary policy during COVID to require folks uh, speaking in public comment to turn on the camera. I'm going to put a discussion about that. A discussion and or vote. Yeah. So if we decide to do it, we could put a vote. But I think that's that's important. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so we are going to move the 10 o'clock rule in executive session. So let's get there quickly. Uh, thank you so much to um, Ms. Fernandez, who we are going to lose, and Sean from ACMI. Have a good night. You guys are all stars. Uh, executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union if which held an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, which you've held an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. Arlington Education Association, AEA.